All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to eDNA. We're going to start off the day. We've got about six bills to hear today, so it'll be a busy one. We'll try and keep the pace moving. And we will start off with Senate Bill 42, and I will recognize Senator Whitley. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Becky Whitley, and I'm honored to serve New Hampshire Senate District 15 which now includes the communities of Bow, Concord, Penacook, and Hopkinton. So I'm pleased to bring forward today Senate Bill 42. Um, I'm particularly pleased because of the bipartisan and bicameral support we have for the bill, including our um, esteemed vice chairwoman. Um, so just simply, this bill prohibits the state from charging interest in the settlement of overpaid state unemployment compensation. But just very narrowly tailored, it only prohibits the collection of interest on overpayment where fraud is not an issue. So I, you know, this is uh, the second year this bill has introduced and I think we have got to a place where it's very targeted and it's also consistent with existing federal law. So the, the federal government already prohibits the state from collecting interest on federal overpayments, regard, actually regardless of whether fraud is found. Um, so this is actually a more narrowly tailored uh, bill for New Hampshire. To put this into context, there are 22 states that do, do not charge interest on state um, unemployment. Um, and if you look at all the other benefits, New Hampshire doesn't charge interest on any other benefit. So I never quite understood why we are singling out this particular benefit to charge interest on. The other contextual piece I think that's really important is coming out of the pandemic. <clears throat> During the pandemic, we saw new folks uh, seeking unemployment. You know, there were new folks that saw job loss related to uh, the pandemic, like gig workers, small business owners, um, and those, you know, staying home for dependent care issues or exposure to the virus. So we saw new folks coming into the system. Um, and as folks may know, by the time an overpayment is discovered, families, individuals have already spent that money, right? And what they're spending it on is rent, childcare, food. So charging interest on top of that feels overly punitive to me. The data is showing us that during the pandemic, we saw service and health sector workers, they were much more impacted uh, by the pandemic job loss and uh, you know, disproportionately they were women. So we saw women that were disproportionately forced to leave the workforce and seek unemployment. In the past few years, New Hampshire women have lost more jobs than men, taken on more caregiving responsibilities, and served as the majority of essential workers on the front line. So, um, you know, this is an issue that sort of disproportionately impacts women. So I, you know, I personally think that applying interest on state unemployment overpayments is really overly punitive. It's just not the message we want to send. And, you know, it can be seen as kind of cruel and unnecessary coming out of a global pandemic when we really want folks to get back to work and particularly as we are likely entering uh, a recession. So I'm happy to take any questions, but we'll defer any sort of technical questions about unemployment to the folks behind me. So thank you. And I respectfully ask for the committee's support of SB 42. Thank you, Senator. Any questions? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Senator Parkins Walker. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator, for being here today. Um, how does an overpayment usually occur? Yeah, it can. It, uh, so there is someone from New Hampshire Legal Assistance who represents a lot of these clients, I think is better equipped to describe those situations, but can, it can happen for a number of reasons. You know, um, mistakes, right? Uh, you know, it happened really fast that people were applying for unemployment. It can happen mistakes, you know, even within the Department of Employment Security. The, the mistakes can happen either way. So again, this bill is not uh, looking at those situations where people lied, right, where there's fraud. We're just looking at the situations where mistakes happen. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Any further questions? Senator Jandro. Thank you, Senator. Um, the question I had is how is that oversight determined? So it's a mistake, but how is it determined that, yes, it was a legitimate mistake mm -hmm. or that it was intentional? Um, just thinking about mm -hmm. that and who will show that oversight? Yeah, thank you for the question. I would. I think I'll defer that also that the process to the experts behind me from the state. 
Thank you for that question. Senator Carson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Turn your mic on, Senator. Oh, sorry. Gotcha. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Senator. Um, I just want to thank you for following up on this issue. This was a bill that we had in the last biennium, and it had support, but it did have some problems with it. And uh, I'm glad to see that you picked this up and you worked through the problem. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll bring up uh, Rich Labors from the New Hampshire Employment Security. Good morning. Welcome to EDNA. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. So, Richard Labors, Deputy Commissioner with New Hampshire Employment Security. Uh, so, Senator Whitley, my senator, um, I agree with everything that he, she has said in her description of the bill. Uh, the department does not have a position on the bill, uh, whether or not um, interest is to be charged on, on overpaid um, unemployment benefits. I believe that's something securely in the realm of the legislature as a, a policy decision. Um, Senator Whitley had described what other states are doing in this respect. Um, one thing I would add, and then I'll, I'll provide a little context for how overpayments are determined, um, how decisions are made with regard to um, whether someone has to repay those overpaid benefits or not, and give you some numbers so you can see how things are looking uh, post, or I don't say post-pandemic, I just say wherever we are with the pandemic um, uh, for 2022, I can give you some numbers there on overpayments um, and individuals that are found overpaid. Um, one additional item I would just note with Senator Whitley talking about um, a disparate impact um, when it comes to gender. So we did see um, a um, larger number of female workers filing for unemployment benefits during the pandemic as compared to male workers. And that was largely a function of the sectors that were most impacted in the gender makeup of those sectors. So pandemic recession, we saw a, a, a major impact on our service sector. So healthcare, uh, retail, uh, hospitality, those sectors tend to be uh, primarily and majority female employees. So we saw a majority of female employees who were looking to the unemployment program for temporary support. Um, you compare that to the prior economic downturn back to the Great Recession in, in 08 um, and 09, that was a majority men. Um, and that was largely because of the sectors that were heavily impacted. So construction, manufacturing, uh, financial services, uh, those, those sectors tend to be a majority male um, in their workforce. So we were looking at about a 60% um, filing rate for men from the Great Recession. So it really it is impacted in terms of the gender makeup of who's filing during a particular period is really impacted by the sector uh, that, is, that is most impacted uh, with job loss. Um, so the, the bill before the committee, uh, so it seeks to uh, prevent um, the uh, state from charging interest on um, benefits that are overpaid um, that are not due to fraud. So situations um, where um, individuals are paid benefits that they shouldn't have and they are determined at fault for that overpayment. And we'll kind of unpackage um, a lot of those words that I just used there. But right now it's a 1% rate, 1% per month that's set by statute. Um, what happens with an individual um, when they, they file and are, are uh, later determined to have been incorrectly paid, um, they are only required to repay those benefits if they are determined to be at fault in causing the overpayment. So um, right now in existing state law, if an individual is found to have been incorrectly paid and it is the department's fault um, or it's the employer's fault, um, then that individual keeps those benefits um, and they do not have to repay them. So interest doesn't come into play. There, there's, there's no interest uh, that is going to accrue because the debt doesn't have to be repaid. Um, in situations where the debt does have to be repaid, um, you, you have both claimant fault that is not fraud, 
um, and then you have claimant fraud. So claimant fault that is not fraud would be a situation where an individual uh, provided information to the department or didn't provide information uh, that they reasonably should have known um, would be impactful on their eligibility uh, for benefits. And so in situations where the, the person is found to have provided that material misstatement or, or failed to provide information that they reasonably should have known needed to be provided, they would be found to have been overpaid, so paid benefits to which they were not eligible to receive, and then they would be found at fault for creating that overpayment, and they would need to repay that. Um, if they disagree with that determination, either the eligibility issue or the issue of finding them at fault, both issues can then be appealed, and that can go up through the administrative appeal structure that first level appeal is a de novo hearing uh, before an appeal tribunal chair uh, for the department and the person's able to present their evidence in their case as to why they feel the decision was wrong, either with respect to their eligibility or with respect to them being found at fault in creating the overpayment. If the person does not appeal um, and they, um, again, they are at fault, they have 60 days to repay those overpaid benefits without the accrual of interest. And then after that 60 days, interest would start to accrue. If they appeal, interest does not accrue during the time that the appeal is pending. So that goes through all levels of appeal, um, which, again, you can go all the way up to the New Hampshire Supreme Court on that. So you're not charged interest while the appeal is pending. So. Um, Again, the, that, that claimant fault type of situation, um, that is not a fraud situation. Um, so, but again, it is a situation where the individual and the information that they provided uh, when they were determined eligible is wrong. Um, and it's determined by an adjudicator, an employee for the state, for employment security, that they should have known that the information was wrong or the, they should have known to provide additional information when they did not. The more egregious cases and, and the situation that Senator Whitley is, is not looking to relieve the, the accrual of interest, so you, your fraud situations. This is when someone makes a willful or intentional um, um, misstatement to the department um, in order to obtain benefits to which they're not eligible. The most common situation that you have in this fraud area are individuals that um, have a, a, a qualifying separation from employment. They're unemployed through no fault of their own, probably a layoff, uh, but they find new employment and they find new employment quickly. Um, and then they don't report it to us. They keep filing. They, they have their weekly claim. They have questions presented to them about whether or not they worked during the week for which they're claiming, whether or not they had earnings for the week for which they're claiming, and they say no. But we also are provided with the wage records from the employer, and so we have investigative staff who then um, take those um, uh, cross-match hits between benefits and wages and then they investigate to determine what was going on there. Should, did the person just have a reasonable confusion? Was this a, a confusion between net and gross? Or is this something where someone was intentionally lying to the department in order to keep receiving unemployment benefits? So those would be the situations that are fraud. Um, but the others that are in play here are just those that are claimant fault. Um, looking at um, activity from 2022, um, and just looking at the state unemployment insurance program, because as, as Senator Whitley had, had accurately stated, the federal pandemic programs, which, is, which have long ended um, in New Hampshire, uh, those did not have interest accrue on any overpaid uh, benefits. Um, so it was only state unemployment that we're talking about here. Um, so for calendar year 2022, we had about 2,400 individuals that were found to have been overpaid benefits. Uh, it was actually 2,432 individuals that were found to be overpaid benefits, meaning they were, they were not eligible for the benefits that they received. Um, that total amount overpaid was about $2.7 million. Um, 
total amount paid in state UI during calendar year 2022 was 25.6 million. So that's about 10.5% of those benefits that were paid that should not have been paid. Um, of that 2.7 million, and I can follow up with an email uh, to the committee with these numbers as well, um, you had about 1.2 million that was paid to individuals that shouldn't have for which they were determined to be at fault. So about 45% of that 2.7 million that was overpaid uh, was determined to be paid to individuals that they were at fault in creating the overpayment, again, because of a material misstatement um, or failure to provide information that an adjudicator determined was reasonable for that person um, to have provided to us in response to the questions or the manner in which they described their separation. Um, once we have the um, other story from the employer was, was not a reasonable explanation um, for, that, for their separation. So you have about 45%, $1.2 million uh, that were determined claimant fault. Um, about 25% is agency error. So again, those are the ones where the person um, is not required to repay those benefits because the agency screwed up. Um, we either put you on the wrong program, we paid you at the wrong weekly benefit amount, um, but those types of situations, the agency um, in the determination finding you ineligible, um, also in that determination would then say, but you are, you are without fault, this is agency error. Um, and then 12% uh, of those overpayments were claimant fraud. So that uh, situation most common being uh, failure to report your earnings when you find new employment after um, having a, a qualifying separation for which you were, you were paid. Um, so again, and just to recap here, so again, this bill, when, you know, as Senator Whitley had correctly stated, we're not looking, she's not looking to um, impact the accrual of interest on individuals that are, are found to have uh, committed fraud, and that was the reason for their being paid benefits to which they were not eligible. But we're talking about situations in which the, it, it's less than fraud, uh, but the claimant is found to be at fault uh, because of what they said or what they didn't say. And it is, it is important um, to note, as I've, I've tried to highlight here, that we, we do make the effort at the time of um, um, being, becoming aware that the person is not eligible, there is a significant effort made to determine why did this happen, who is at fault, and if the agency screwed up, if the employer was the one that made the mistake, because of providing inaccurate information. Um, that, that is on them, um, and the individual does not have to repay, so it doesn't accrue interest. Um, so there, there were some pretty egregious situations during the pandemic uh, with individuals being found to be at fault, but something short of fraud. Um, a lot to do uh, with, with self-employed filers, a lot to do with people uh, filing um, indicating to us that they were unemployed because of the pandemic, uh, but they had actually left their job voluntarily at the end of 2019 to pursue something else. But those aren't really the situations we're talking about here. You know, we're, we're talking about regular unemployment, so this is covered employment, W-2 employment, not self-employed individuals, and these are people um, that are determined to be not eligible because we're an eligibility-based program um, and not an entitlement-based program. Um, some other common situations that, that could come up, finding someone to be um, um, overpaid, um, in some instances to be at fault, could be the manner in which they describe their work search activities during a particular week, because you have to be actively searching for work e each and every week that you are filing for unemployment, unless you fall into um, one of the um, types of situations where you're on a temporary layoff. But, could be someone who's um, inaccurately providing information to us about their work search. It could be someone inaccurately providing information about their availability for work. You have to be able and available for work while you are filing. So if someone has a temporary condition, an injury, um, and they are 
they are unavailable for work and they don't report that to us, that could be a situation where someone is found to be overpaid and be at fault uh, for that overpayment. So that's really the situations uh, that we're talking about here. Um, in terms of uh, um, a few remaining items, um, like we do with all legislative proposals that impact the unemployment program, we have provided um, the uh, published language to the U.S. Department of Labor for a conformity and compliance review, as we are required to do. Um, I, I suspect, I don't want to speak for the U.S. Department of Labor, but I suspect they will not take issue with this proposal. They largely look at the charging of interest as being in the state purview, um, hence the, the statistics that Senator Whitley had mentioned about those states that do charge interest and those that don't. Um, so once we receive that official response from the U.S. Department of Labor, we'll share that with the committee. Uh, but again, I, I suspect that they will not take issue uh, with the bill. Um, they won't consider it a, a, any sort of conformity or compliance issue uh, for the state. Um, so um, with that, I will um, stop uh, talking. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. I, I have a couple, um, just for my own clarity. So. If I'm understanding you correctly, the impact will be on about $1.2 million that you estimate that, and what is the normal recovery rate? So we are charging 1% a month, but typically how long does it take for these funds to be returned? Because the uh, fiscal mode didn't give us any uh, dollar value on what the impact would be. Yeah, so I, I believe we did, uh, we included a number for the amount of interest that was collected in uh, 2022. I'd have to go back and then look at that. It was, um, I can take another look. Um, so the, the impact is um, there are, so yeah, thank you, Murray. Uh, so about $91,000 in interest was collected um, in 2022. And, and I did, and I'll just point out again, the, the department doesn't look at interest as, uh, our budget is not dependent upon our collection of interest. Uh, that's you know, why we're not taking a position here. Um, but the, the, the time period that it takes for an individual to repay that debt um, really depends on a lot of factors. The department has a lot of uh, tools that are available to it, depending on the type of overpayment. So fraud overpayments, we have very aggressive tools to collect that debt. We can offset your federal income tax refund. We can, off, we can garnish wages on future employment. Uh, we obviously would offset any future uh, benefit payments that you're, you're receiving from us. Um, so the, the ability to recoup a fraud debt is um, much more uh, significant because of the tools that we have as compared to a non-fraud debt. So non-fraud, uh, we, we aren't able to garnish wages. We, do, we cannot offset a federal income tax refund. So what we're largely dependent upon for a non-fraud overpayment is a voluntary payment plan. So, so the, the debt doesn't go away. Um, and if an individual were to come back and file for unemployment benefits, a portion of that new unemployment benefit would be offset to repay their debt. Uh, but what we largely do with individuals in both uh, fraud and non-fraud situations is we enter into a payment agreements. Um, that payment agreement is dependent upon their financial circumstances at the time. Um, we have them fill out a financial affidavit, um, and then there are, we have a, a schedule for the time period uh, that we like to see the debt repaid depending on the amount of the debt, but then the financial circumstances of the individual as attested to us on their financial affidavit really control the monthly obligation and how quickly it gets repaid. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? <clears throat> Senator Dendro. Thank you. Now you had mentioned too that right now about 12% claimant fraud. Um, and, and that was not just specific to 2022. That is what the, the average is? Um, that was specific to 2022. It so was. so the 12% the, the were uh, overpayments that were, that were investigated and found to be fraud in 2022. 2022. Has, um, of course, the pandemic was kind of an unusual um, situation. Over the years, are you seeing increased um, fraud or decreased fraud? Or has it pretty much stayed? Um, that that, that number is a little bit higher than it was prior to the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, um, our improper payment rate, what the, the feds refer to for states in terms of um, how we're measured, um, was under 10%. It was around 9%. Um, so that, that 
amount of fraud, um, you know, earnings fraud is, is always, unfortunately, is always um, in the unemployment program despite best efforts, despite um, um, a lot of education that we do with individuals when they come in to file. They come in, they sit for, a, for an hour-long workshop in one of the uh, American job centers throughout the state. Uh, we go over the do's and don'ts of filing. We talk to them about the importance of being accurate with your response to information, what you need to provide to us. When you have questions, come and talk to us. We have resources available on the phone and in the office. Um, but we also have a strong relationship with the Department of Justice. We actually um, have a full-time unemployment insurance fraud prosecutor um, who prosecutes the more egregious cases to try to um, create a better deterrent effect uh, for future fraud. Um, and individuals do go to prison. Uh, for, for fraud, for those more egregious cases. Um, but um, the, the most um, common type of fraud that we saw during the pandemic was not earnings fraud. Um, it was actually ID theft. So that, that was not individuals in New Hampshire uh, committing that. Earnings fraud are, are people in New Hampshire, right? And those are people that we're going to recoup those benefits because they are here. The identity theft that we saw during the pandemic was individuals, I don't know where they were. Um, uh, but they have, you know, they have um, a lot of data stolen from uh, New Hampshire citizens in the decades prior and saw the, uh, saw the pandemic as a great opportunity to cash in. So uh, we saw a lot of identity theft claims, so stolen identities in those types of criminals using that information to file claims during the pandemic. Fortunately, New Hampshire, and, and, and I can't take credit for this, our folks in our investigative unit did a heck of a job of uh, finding that before benefits paid. Um, there aren't any published statistics yet, state to state, uh, but I would say New Hampshire, if not, uh, was not the best, one of the best states um, in detecting it prior to payment. Um, so that was a, a different type of fraud that we saw then. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Seeing none, thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Next, we will have uh, Dawn McKinney, who wants to speak in... Oh, she didn't want to speak. She just wants to be in favor. Would you like to speak? We're, we're in favor of the bill. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm sorry. It's okay. Dawn McKinney, we support the bill. I wasn't necessarily planning to testify. I feel like it's been well covered, and okay. you've, thank you, you seem I'm to just, have the information you need. <laughs> I'm just checking my boxes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's all I have on the list. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Seeing none, we're going to close the hearing on Senate Bill 42. All right, next up, we will uh, open the hearing on Senate Bill 44, and we will recognize Senator Carson. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members of the Senate EDNA Committee. For the record, my name is Sharon Carson, and I have the pleasure of representing Senate District 14, comprising the towns of Londonderry, Hudson, and Auburn. And I have for your consideration this morning, Senate Bill 44, FN, relative to license requirements for certain alcohol and other drug use professionals. And just quickly, this bill adjusts the license, licensing requirements for alcohol and other drug use professionals. Um, as we all know, New Hampshire remains caught in the grips of a devastating addiction and mental health epidemic, which steals the lives of hundreds of Granite Staters each year. As of September, 335 Granite Staters had died due to an overdose in 2022. And New Hampshire is on track to exceed its 2021 totals, which is the first meaningful increase in several years. Severe workforce shortages continue to cripple New Hampshire's ability to overcome this crisis and provide the substance use and mental health treatment services needed to support individuals and families in need. Senate Bill 44 takes a number of steps to address workforce challenges by creating greater flexibility and efficiency in substance use licensing. 
Specifically, this bill proposes to expand the scope of practice for master level substance use counselors to allow them to treat mental health disorders without co-occurring co -occurring substance use disorders. This would even the playing field. Master's level mental health clinicians are currently authorized to treat substance use and mental health and substance use counselors often have the same college education and degree. This would allow master's level substance use counselors to treat more patients in need and would prevent them from having to stop treating patients if primary diagnosis changes to mental health as happens very often. This also takes a step towards reciprocity for recovery support workers who are licensed in other states. This aligns the number of continuing education hours required for recovery support workers with the national standard set by the national accrediting body, which is the International Certification and Reciprocity Consortium. The LADAC board would still need to act to authorize reciprocity, but this would allow them to do so if they chose to. This would also expand the pool of students who qualify for licensure as bachelor level substance use counselors. This would allow criminal justice majors who are considered subjectively by the LADAC board to more easily pursue a career in treatment. And this bill would remove the subjectivity and expand the pool of qualifying students. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I'm going to conclude my testimony, but I would like to add a caveat here. Um, this bill was first brought forward to Senator Bradley with the assurances that all parties were in agreement um, we've subsequently discovered that the parties are not in agreement. So my suggestion here to you this morning is that the parties need to get together to come forward and resolve their problems and their differences before this moves forward. I think that's going to be very important. If they're busy fighting each other, they're not treating patients. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your time and your indulgence this morning. Um, there are folks behind me who can answer questions much better than I can. So, again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Senator. All right. Next, we will call on Cynthia Whitaker from CDHA, and she is opposed to the bill and wishes to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm Susan Cashel from the DuPont Group. I'm okay. here with Cynthia, and we have a letter to submit. And I apologize, it's incorrectly addressed to the Health and Human Services oh, Committee. All right. We will correct that through the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and Senators. Um, and for the record, we I agree with so much of what you said, Senator. Um, we are uh, in an epidemic. We do have a workforce shortage. And I've been sitting in this very seat uh, before testifying to committees about the need to move forward and change some of our burdensome licensure requirements. Um, unfortunately, we are at SEBA in disagreement to the beginning pieces of um, the legislation as it is currently written, um, specifically the expansion of the scope of MLADAX. We completely support uh, the alignment of the rules for uh, CRSWs and agree with the um, expansion of the bachelor's degree as added in there. Um, and why we are in uh, disagreement um, is because um, while we need to move swiftly to ease licensure burden, while we need to move swiftly to increase the workforce, we should not do it without proper oversight and potential risk to consumers who, that receive mental health services. Right now, we have two different boards or three boards, um, one specific to the Board of Alcohol and Drug Services and another specific to the Board of Mental Health Practice. The MLADAC falls under the Board of Alcohol and Drug Services. That board does have MLADAC sitting on it, many of whom are duly licensed by both, both the Board of Mental Health Practice and the Board of Alcohol and Drug Services, much like myself, who is licensed by both the Board of Psychology and the Board of Alcohol and Drug Services. But it, changing this requirement would mean that people would not seek dual licensure. There is no requirement in the current RSA 
that requires that the degree be uh, certified by a counseling accrediting authority, like there is in the RSAs for those who practice under the Board of Mental Health Practice or the Board of Psychology. Mm -hmm. In addition, both boards, um, if you look, there is collaboration currently saying that 1,500 hours of each can cross over. That recognition by our boards is because there's a recognition of that there is often different training. Um, and so while we support wholeheartedly efforts to improve licensure, making it easier for people to get licensed, the way our structure is currently set up, we do not believe there is proper oversight. And I'm not certain what playing field we're trying to flatten or um, layer. Um, the playing field should be to provide our clients and our constituents with the best services that we can and then make sure that they have boards that can protect them and that understand those services. So um, we're willing to work around language with our partners. I appreciated um, your comments on that, Senator Carson, um, and we'd be willing to do so. So. Thank you. Will you take some questions? Oh, absolutely. Any questions from the committee? Senator Altshaw. <clears throat> So in the RSA, uh, 330C16, um, that the language is seeking to change, it does say that it could be in mental health counseling, it could be in psychology, it could also be in solely substance use treatment. Um, it could be in human services or an equivalent. Um, so it does require that the college is accredited as a college, but unlike RSAs that suit um, for licenses under the Mental Health Board that require accreditation as a counseling program or as a mental health program. This RSA for MLADEX does not. Follow it. Yep. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, that might be setting right on, I'm not honest. Senator Altshaw, could you turn your mic on? I'm sorry, I just noticed. My apologies. So um, if I'm understanding you correctly, and please correct me if I am off base, the, the, <clears throat> the, the friction is in that in making, these, making this parity, there becomes possibly a gap in people whose master's programs um, include that clinical training in mental health provisors, provide, um, provide, providing, yes. So um, that you can be certified and have a master's level education in providing supports for um, drug and alcohol and other substance um, disorders, but not necessarily a mental health disorder. And we know the code that the co-occurrences are, are uh, plentiful Correct. and that often the uses of substances are in the masking and the feeling not bad from trauma and mental health issues. Right. And so once a layer is peeled back, if someone is not trained in those mental health services, they have now reached the cap of their professional abilities. Is that correct? Is that what your the friction is? Is that yeah, now, I mean, that, that, now is, that person needs a different kind of help? That's a piece of, of, of the friction. I mean, okay. I, I, and we don't want people to have to get one kind of treatment and then another treatment. And, yes. and again, that is the spirit of the ask here, which sure. we, again, support. Yet, we, we have different um, rules. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that the RSAs are set up there isn't the same level of oversight protection requirement of those. Now, there, and Latex do have to take a co-occurring uh, test, which I've taken. Yep. Um, and it does have some requirements related to mental health conditions, but mental health conditions are much broader than just those that tend to co-occur or can co-occur with substance use disorder. Like for the 10 community mental health centers uh, and SIBA, who I'm specifically here representing, 
um, we serve a broad array of mental health problems. And one might think we'd be fully in support of this because of our workforce shortage and wanting to have MLADAX be able to provide those services. However, what we know is that the way that the two boards are currently set, the way that the requirements are set, that an MLADAC being able to just blatantly serving any mental health opens up perhaps a risky door that we haven't fully considered what are those ramifications, what are the rule changes that would be needed, what are the training requirements that would be needed to be different, um, what should a board that's overseeing solely mental health services look like and be comprised of versus the Board of Mental Health Practice has varying um, degrees and a wide array of mental health practitioners on it because they oversee the wide array of mental health treatment. Thank you. Senator Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about, you You keep referencing that licensing protects you. Um, Clients. Your, I, I want that clarification made because licensing protects your clients. Amen, yes. That if you, as a professional, do something inappropriate, Correct. that there's a way that your clients or anyone that you serve mm -hmm. has a place to go to voice their complaints. Correct. And can affect your licensure and then your ability to work. So I want to make sure, yes. I want to make that very, very Absolutely. clear. I that agree. is the purpose of licensure, not to protect you, because you said that a few times. Oh, I'm sorry. And it's not my I, intention. I, licensure protects the people that you work for. Absolutely. Um, secondly, are you asking to to be licensed by the mental health board, or are you asking to have dual licensure? So I am duly licensed. So okay. I am licensed currently by the Board of Psychology and the Board of Alcohol and Drug Services, as are many individuals okay. who have taken the time to ensure that they have training in both mm -hmm. mental health and substance use to be able to treat that wide array. So may I follow up, Mr. Chairman? Yes, follow up. Thank you. <clears throat> so if we were to change this, that would require that um, uh, M. Ladax be dual licensure, both by the uh, uh, drug and alcohol, as a drug and alcohol council, and that board, and the mental health board, would that solve the problem? So I don't believe all M. Ladax need to be supervised or licensed in both ways, right? When folks are treating, co-occurring, when they're working within the auspices of substance use disorder treatment, there is if there's co-occurring, there's mental health, it makes sense. But when we open the RSA to and all mental health services, which that word all isn't there, but that's essentially what the language would allow, mm -hmm. that's to us where it feels like there isn't the broad level of oversight that a board of mental health has, that the board of alcohol and drug uh, counseling does not currently have. And while there are people currently on that board, and you will hear from others, that they are currently duly licensed, if this moves forward without that further requirement, right, that people can serve mental Ill illness of any kind without a uh, license from a board of mental health practice, there will be no requirement for those people to continue to have those dual license. What will be the oversight for that other broad array of mental health services? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So who's going to determine who has to be licensed? Is, are you willing to give that to the Office of Professional Licensure to determine who needs to have that dual license? So personally, I, I think we need to think about what is our structure in New Hampshire. I mean, we have a Board of Mental Health Services under a Bureau of Mental Health Services under DHHS. We have a Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Services under DHHS. They have very different rules, very different regulations. We have a Board of Alcohol and Drug Services for professionals. We have a Board of Mental Health Practice. We have a Board of Psychology. So our current structure has those two things separate. And so there's, those are the protections right now of keeping those things separate moving forward, allowing practice across that aisle without the boards and the oversight across the aisle potentially has risk that I don't think we're fully considering at this moment. 
one more. One. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't believe you answered the question. It is really about who is going to determine who needs to be duly licensed. Mm -hmm. Who do you think should do that? Do you OPLC? think OPLC? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Senator Gendo. So with the insurance company, too, I know right now um, people, folks that are being treated, their insurance company will um, pay or not pay based on licensure. So will they look at this and say, okay, now that we're requiring both, that they'll up their, um, I don't even know how to say it, will, will they require more now from, um, not really sure how to word this. So you've got the dual. So will they continue to pay if a person is not duly licensed? Um, and that may be out of your yeah, purview. They, but yeah, they may, they may, they may not. It depends on the insurance company. I mean, my experience as the CEO of the Mental Health Center um, is that oftentimes um, it, it's more about the program and it's more about what is what are the services being provided and then does the person have the right credential to provide those services um, than it is about the specific degree. And this, the language proposed increases the scope. So an MLADAC would be licensed to provide mental health services across the board. Mr. Chairman, can I just follow up? One, one more. more, yep. So this is probably something you can't answer today, but yeah. one of the experiences that I've heard, because um, I represent the North Country, and mm. one of a uh, very, very effective program there is faith-based. So, and that's something that we haven't addressed, but, and I know we can't get into it today, but that, I just want to be able to express that a lot of faith-based programs are extremely effective and that there's um, no co-occurrence. Mm -hmm. And there's, there is that under the Board of Mental Health Practice. There are pastoral counselors licensed under the Board of Mental Health Practice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming in and testifying today. Next, we will uh, call up Jake Barry from New Futures, who wishes to speak and is in favor of the bill. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. Thanks so much for having me this morning. Uh, my name is Jake Barry. I'm the vice president of policy at New Futures. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, health policy uh, and advocacy organization. Uh, we've been working for uh, more than 25 years in the space of uh, substance use and, and alcohol regulation and others. Um, I don't want to repeat too much of what uh, Senator Carson said in her introduction, but I do want to emphasize New Future's strong support for this bill. Uh, I know I don't need to tell any of you uh, that for years workforce shortages have been one of the biggest obstacles to overcoming our state's addiction crisis. Um, throughout our substance use treatment system, the lack of counselors and other professionals make it impossible for many individuals and families to get the treatment they need. Um, as you've heard this morning, SB 44 won't uh, single-handedly solve all of our workforce issues, but it will take several important steps uh, to bring, help bring more people into the profession and to help get treatment to more, uh, to more people in need. Um, to address some of the points that we've been discussing so far, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we at New Futures believe strongly that we, we need to align and integrate our behavioral health treatment systems as much as we possibly can. We've taken, uh, you know, over the years, uh, the legislature has taken several steps to uh, better integrate licensing to create a more efficient and streamlined licensing process. This is intended to, uh, to address that. We're not in any way trying to uh, diminish the quality or oversight of the treatment services provided. We are merely trying to ensure that people can uh, get the treatment they, they need from qualified professionals. Uh, and to ensure that people don't have to give up their treatment provider when a uh, primary diagnosis changes, as again often happens. We know that um, uh, you know, the line between uh, substance use and mental health concerns and co-occurring uh, disorder is, is, is a thin one and can, can move frequently. And again, we just want to make sure we have the flexibility uh, in the system to allow people to uh, get and to maintain the treatment they need. Um, to address some of the other uh, parts of the bill, again, uh, we feel strongly uh, that uh, taking steps toward reciprocity for recovery support workers uh, is an important step. 
Um, you know, we have uh, worked very hard as a state to expand our, our, uh, our network of recovery centers. I think we're now up to 21 across the state. Um, building that workforce is the, is the next key component of, of making that service available and being able to bring uh, people in from other states is, is, is critical. Uh, so to take the steps to align those continuing education requirements is, is uh, uh, clearly very important. And then the criminal justice degree piece. Again, we want uh, we know that there are some students who study critical justice uh, in, in, in college uh, who, uh, over that time, come to find out that the law enforcement is not where they want to go, and they want to place, uh, place their efforts more into the treatment system. Uh, and and this would open the door for them to do that. So uh, uh, we we feel strongly that three, these three steps will again they will not single handedly uh, solve our workforce problem, but they will certainly help. Uh, and we uh, we appreciate your thoughts and your support. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Any questions? Senator uh, Perkins Quill. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Jake, for being here. Um, so, ha I guess knowing your strong support and you know hearing how these different changes affect the workforce, I mean, what would be sort of your response if we were to limit um, master licensed alcohol, drug, and counselors? If we were to limit the expansion of their ability to provide care to duly licensed um, providers, do you think that would be overly limiting, um, or do you have concerns about them not being duly licensed? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, certainly uh, there there are others uh, here that you'll hear from later this morning who are in the field who have much better experience uh, with this than I do, and we are, are uh, happy to uh, to talk with our friends and partners at SEBA to work something through here. That said. Um, you know, we, we really, we want to make sure, we're here to try and take down barriers. We're here to try to ensure that, uh, you know, that there are not unnecessary, obst unnecessary obstacles to licensure. Uh, so, again, my understanding, there is a great deal of overlap and commonalities in the training, uh, in much of the training and education that our treatment counselors are, are receiving, both on the SUD and the mental health side. We would love to um, be able to recognize, acknowledge that, and work with that to the extent that we can. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, the system we have now where people are required to be duly licensed uh, to, to treat both, um, there are many people who are able to do that, but that's also time and cost intensive for people. And we just want to make sure that, again, that barrier is not uh, overly burdensome or unnecessary. Thank you. Any further questions? Mm -hmm. Senator Alshaw. Uh, please turn on your mic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Um, I wonder if you could. Um, just give us your opinion or New Futures opinion on page two of the bill and where uh, part six, having graduated with a bachelor's degree in clinical mental health, social work, psychology, substance abuse counseling, addiction studies, I'm seeing a theme. Sure. And then criminal justice. I'm curious about what your feelings are of of a criminal justice degree being in that same category sure. as what we know and have experienced over and over again is that uh, criminal justice degrees don't necessarily have um, a fabulous component of, of mental health sure. awareness, treatment. In fact, our own um, standards and training has upped our critical response training. We've had to retrain people to be part of the, um, the, crisis, the mobile crisis units. Like a criminal justice degree does not, um, to the best of my knowledge, prepare somebody for the, the arts of mental health. Sure, sure. I, I, I don't see where they, I, I love the idea, but sure. I, don't, I don't see where that flows. And how do you feel about that? I, so I appreciate the question, Senator. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great one. And there are other people here who can speak more specifically to the components of a criminal justice degree than I can. What I will say is that, you know, it has been um, the goal of us at New Futures and, and our partners all across the state and the country to uh, sort of embed in, uh, you know, criminal justice studies and the law enforcement system more broadly, more uh, more of the tenets of, of behavioral health uh, response and treatment. Uh, that certainly remains a work in progress. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we have a long way to go. 
That said, uh, we do know that there are a number of schools, Southern New Hampshire University in particular, that do include within their criminal justice studies a concentration on behavioral health. And there, there is a greater effort, again, at Southern New Hampshire University and others to uh, you know, embed more of those principles and address more of those topics. Uh, our view is that uh, recognizing that the qualifying uh, undergraduate degree is just one component of, of, of licensure. Uh, it, this is a way to uh, accommodate and support individuals who, uh, again, may have at the beginning of their studies thought the criminal, or, or in, during their undergraduate studies thought the criminal justice was the way to go, but over that time were uh, exposed to um, the behavioral health needs that we're facing and that they, they want to switch tracks and they want to um, uh, uh, you know, pursue licensure as a treatment professional. Uh, so I think this is a way to, uh, to encourage them, support them, again, knowing that all of the other requirements of licensure, all of the, the training hours, the supervision hours, everything, you know, the, the, the testing ensure that they are receiving this, the uh, behavioral health specific uh, training that they, they require. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Kevin. Next, we have uh, Diane Kastnici from the New Hampshire Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counselors Association, who favors the bill and wishes to speak. Thank you, Diane. We're running a little behind, so maybe if we can keep our uh, comments. Clip I notes. Know this is, yeah, this is a, a very important issue, no question. But from So my name is Diane Kastrucci. I am the executive director of the New Hampshire Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counselors Association. And we are in support of this bill. And I wanted, I had thoughts on what I wanted to present, but I want to like jump to some of the questions that you were asking of others. The reason why this bill is important to the North Country is because it's so hard to find someone. M. Ladex up there are like finding unicorns. And Oftentimes, an agency can hire someone with one credential, but they don't have enough funds to hire people with multiple credentials. So being able to honor um, the mental health education and training that a MLADAC has without saying, oh, that's just a substance use degree that you don't really know what you're doing when it comes to mental health. The important thing for any clinician is to practice within their expertise. That's the most important thing. That's why we have ethical code of standards that we practice within our expertise. I, I don't, I have an MLADAC. I don't know schizophrenia. I've worked with schizophrenia in different jobs with a, a, a strong supervisor at the time. That's not my specialty, but it is a mental health disorder. If I were treating co-occurring disorders, I could treat anything that is a mental health disorder where substance use is part of it. That's part of my scope of practice right now. But then, when that person no longer has that, whatever disorder it is, I would need to refer that out. That's like telling a, a PA, we know you're, you're acting like a doctor, but you're not really one. Because if I go to that PA for help with obesity and diabetes, and I take care of the obesity part and I lose the weight, and, but my diabetes is still off track for one reason or another biologically, that PA has said, well, you have to go see a real doctor now. You have to go see an MD now. And yet, as you can imagine, all the stuff that goes into losing weight and then be told you have to switch to someone else, or if it... Um, if I am, have chronic depression and I also have a substance use disorder and I am working on both of those at the same time and I am working with the MLADA because that's who I connect with and that's who's closest to me and all of the other reasons for why we choose the counselors that we do. And suddenly that says, well, you know, I, your primary do diagnosis isn't alcoholism anymore. We've kind of We've, we've kind of got that addressed. Your primary di diagnosis now is the depression. I can't treat you anymore. You're going to have to go find someone else. That's the situation with the MLADEX and why it's important to recognize that um, MLADEX 
they have the experience to treat mental health disorders when they're complicated by substance use. It doesn't mean they don't understand the mental health disorders anymore after the substance use is gone. That's the importance of this. Now, one of the, one of the testimonies that you've heard is that our systems are siloed. And until those silos are fixed, we can't do anything. And we think they should stay siloed if they're siloed. But that's not the case in practice on the clinician level. We do peer collaboration with each other um, all the time. We supervise each other all the time. So th th this, the statement that the systems aren't set up for that Maybe there's more room for that for the integration to happen. The state has been trying to do integration for so long, and it's such an ongoing process. But why not let it start with the clinicians who already recognize each other as peers? Criminal justice. Of all, so as the director of a counselors association, when someone is considering working in substance use, I commonly get the call. Like, what should I do? How, where do I start? I want to move to New Hampshire. Where do I start? The very first question is always, what's your degree? And when they say criminal justice, most often I've said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to get another degree to be able to do substance use here. I started my career working in criminal justice. Not that that was my degree, but that was I loved working with offenders, male offenders. I, I just real, it was, it was my target population. When I was there, I worked with other people who started as corrections officers and because they, they wanted to help people, but then they realized that the rule following and the counseling, like which ones were better suited to their personalities. And they have not been able to move forward as a substance use counselor, even though that's where their passion is, because that, their degree was different than that. One of the things that, as Senator Carson said, like send people back to do more work on language. One of the caveats that I would say with the language that we could put in is criminal justice with substance use content, because that could potentially address that. However, there is a criminal justice program at Southern New Hampshire University that has a specialty in substance use. And the LADAC board previously has approved that for people to get the LADAC. And so the attempt to put criminal justice as part of that language is to take away the subjectivity so that it doesn't have to go in front of them every time. What has happened is that people with the degree from Southern New Hampshire University have been approved, but then the board changes and different people are on the board, and then that institutional knowledge is gone because people have term limits when they're on a board. So it's about taking care of that. In the past year, I've had four people reach out to me saying, I have a criminal justice degree. Can I get a LADAC? And I'm like, you know, wait and see, we'll see what we can do. But that would ex expand the pool of practice of people who can work in substance use who have the LADAC. In order to get the, the LADAC, you need more than just a degree. So you also need to have a clinical supervisor overseeing you. That clinical supervisor, according to the new rules that the LADAC board has recently passed, um, they have to be assessed by their supervisor on the different categories of what a substance use counselor does. And they're not allowed to have any unacceptable ratings on these 12 core functions or 18 categories of competence. They're not allowed to. So that on-site supervisor is looking over that as well as the 4,000 hours of experience that they have to have. So we are in strong support. Those are the primary reasons for both of those, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our last speaker is uh,
from Kelly Ludke from the Board of Licensing for Alcohol Drug Use. And she wants to speak, but I believe has no position. Am I correct? Because you checked between the boxes? I know. I wasn't sure how to answer because I'm like 95% <coughs> okay. in support. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, would it be okay if I asked my LADAC board members to come with me, or do you want them to testify separately? Um, no, just <coughs> you can, <coughs> excuse me, you can bring them. I'm just going to ask you to kind of keep it to a couple of minutes. We're really Absolutely. way behind here. Sure. Come on up. I'll just have you all introduce yourselves. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kelly Ludke, and I, I can't believe you said my last name right. I've never heard that before. Um, <laughs> I so try. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and um, uh, today I'm representing the LADAC board, and I am the board chair. Good morning, Senator and Chairmen and Women. Uh, my name is Jessica Carter, um, and I'm here representing the LADAC board. I'm the CRSW on the Board of Licensing. Good morning. My name is Joni O'Brien. I'm also a board member. Um, I have an M. Ladak and a Marriage and Family Therapy Master's underneath that. Well, thank you all for coming. So go ahead, tell us what you got. Thank you. Um, so we're here today to say that we are uh, about 95% in support of this bill. We agree that um, M. Ladak should be allowed to treat mental health disorders because that is what we're currently doing. And currently, they do have to have a substance use uh, principal diagnosis in order for us to do that, but we're still doing the work. So we are in support of that. We are also in support of the CRSW education, continuing education hours to be changed to 24. The part we'd like to speak about today is adding criminal justice to the statute uh, 330C17. So currently that statute does say that a person has to have graduated with a bachelor's degree in clinical mental health, social work, psychology, substance use, addiction, or human services, or equivalent program. And as people have testified here today, somebody can come through with a criminal justice degree and it is reviewed by the board and if it has that substance use background, it's been approved. And I think what's important to consider here is that not all criminal justice degrees have those substance use components. The one that is coming from SNU, that substance use component was actually built by me. So um, I understand and know that there are some programs that have that, but the majority do not. Um, and you'll hear some testimony from people we've spoken to that got criminal justice degrees, wanted to go into the LADAC field, and went through the proper channels to do so because they didn't feel the criminal justice degree had that behavioral human component that some of the other uh, bachelor degrees that are listed in state statute have. Um, would you like to speak to that? Absolutely. Um, what Kelly said, um, I also as a CRSW on the board full heartedly agree with aligning um, our CRSW reciprocity uh, with I ICNRC uh, national standards. Um, as it sits right now, we're currently able with the rules as they're written, it's easier for us to lose CRSWs to other states than it is for us to gain them back. Therefore, in turn, leading and enhancing workforce shortages, which for us right now is higher than it's ever been. Um, I um, didn't introduce myself this way, but I am a woman in recovery from substance use disorder. Um, and um, I actually work with a handful of other people that identify uh, as being in recovery. And one of the biggest concerns uh, that we have with um, including the criminal justice degree for LADAC um, a lot of people with substance use disorder have a significant history of trauma with criminal justice. Um, I surveyed um, our 10 employees, 90% of them um, reported to me that they've had tra traumatic experiences with police, law enforcement, corrections officers. We know that this isn't across the board. Um, however, um, you know, having experienced traumatic uh, in interactions with law enforcement myself um, and needing to go to therapy to address and get through this, uh, I would find it challenging um, to um, relate to someone um, who may not be able to put their biases aside and help me work through this trauma. Um, 
I've seen some stigmatized, stigmatizing language in the curriculum. Um, why are we updating the language in this bill, but not, um, but uh, attempting to include uh, majors that don't align with that language? Um, we already allow the equivalency, um, and. Um, also questioned our state's ability to provide adequate supervision to all of these uh, new majors that we're looking to um, accept. Uh, we currently don't have the infrastructure, we barely have the infrastructure to uh, appropriately supervise the late acts that we have now. How would we be able to increase that with the um, increasing number of um, applicants for late acts? I think I would just want to further add, thinking about this, that um, somebody had testified that when an equivalent program comes to the LADAC board, the measure to determine if it's equivalent is subjective. And as chair, I can tell you, sometimes it does feel that way. So I would be willing to work with parties, as Senator Carson said in the beginning of this hearing, to maybe come up with some kind of objective rubric that um, an equivalent program would have to meet in, er in order to kind of, it would make my life easier <laughs> to have a degree come through. It either meets these rubric pieces or it doesn't. And then that would make it a little bit more objective. So I'm completely open and I think I can speak for the board to say that we're open and working with other parties in determining a way to make that process more objective. Um, we're also in rulemaking again, so we would also be willing to add maybe a criminal justice piece in rule versus statute with maybe some pieces that would include substance use education with that criminal justice degree. So I just want to say, you know, yes, we're in opposition to it, but we want to work with parties because our mission is really to increase workforce development. And would you like to say? Well, I think they, they said everything. I would just repeat. Um, so the, the things that I would just punctuate is that um, line 16 for the m Act opening up mental health disorders, as Kelly said, this is already what LADACs do. They, they treat mental health disorders with the complication, Diane also said this, with the complication of substance use. So to remove the complication of substance use, um, and just allow them to do what they already do with the mental health is just fair and realistic. Um, so that's my view. Um, in terms of the criminal justice, I'm online with Kelly, and you know if we can just add some language to sort of um, not keep the door wide open because there's plenty of criminal justice people coming into the state that do not have any substance abuse whatsoever. So I've worked in the field of corrections for 17 years, <laughs> and I went back and got my master's um, in marriage and family therapy and became an MLADAC. And um, there's a, um, a different mentality coming from criminal justice. I'm speaking personally from that. And those that do want to do the counseling, I think they should, and I think there should be a pathway for them. So that's all I'm saying here. Well, thank you all. Will you take questions? Yes. Any questions? Carson. Senator Carson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, and thank you for being here. Um, I think, um, Ms. Ludke, we're on the same wavelength because I, I wrote a note here. Can we amend the criminal justice part to say um, a degree with criminal justice with so many credit hours of substance abuse um, education. Right. I, I think, and I would love to have a conversation because uh, if you were instrumental in getting the program at SNU, yes. that you would have a pretty good idea um, what that would encompass. Absolutely. And I think that it would make it a lot easier for the board because there is a bright line here and people, anyone who wished to go into the field would be able to see, oh, I can use my criminal justice degree, but I need to go and get the, uh, meet these requirements. So I think we can flesh that out, and I look forward to working with you. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Carson. Senator Altshuler. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking my question. I, um, Ms. Ludke, you had said that um, when the board reviews an applicant, um, there's a subjectiveness to 
evaluating their degree. Um, do I understand you correctly that if someone comes to, to, comes to the board and they have um, a degree in psychology, it's not necessarily just a straight like check, they're good, that you're actually reviewing that program maybe or the school it was or right. Am I, am I on the right track there? I think so. Um, well, part of the state statute does say it has to be an accredited program, so right. we do have to check that. But when it fits psychology, it definitely goes faster through the track because it's in okay. state statute, but it is also reviewed. Any follow? One. So um, <laughs> in, the, in line 21, equivalent program, yes. um, would it currently, as the statute, uh, would currently... Um, you, the board evaluate a um, applicant who had a criminal justice degree under the umbrella of equivalent programming. And so the crux of my question being that if the elimination of criminal justice from that line, if that was taken out, does that, that, does that exclude someone with a criminal justice degree from applying to this, to get this certification? No, ma'am. It doesn't, okay. Thank All you. Right. Well, we thank you. Oh, we got one more. All right, Senator Kendall. I just wanted to thank um, Jessica for her transparency and honesty in sharing with us, and congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and yeah, thank you. I would, I would dare say you're going to make the best counselor ever because of the experience that you've gone through. So thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we thank you for coming in today and testifying. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, Senator Rashardi who signed in in favor. I have... Paul Minahan from the New Hampshire Hospital Association has signed in in favor. I have Peter, I'm sorry, I can't, Dal Dalpra from Hooksit who signed in with no opinion. Jessica Carter with no opinion from the Board of Licensing for Alcohol. Hmm? In the middle. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right. I guess I've got you all on here. And then, okay, that's everyone. Oh, and I won one on the last page. Uh, Courtney Tanner, who is in favor from Dartmouth Health. Anybody else that wishes to testify? Seeing none, we're going to close the hearing on Senate Bill 44. Thank you all. All right, we're going to open up the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 45 as soon as Senator Carson is ready. Sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> All right, we'll be in contact. Thank you, Senator. You have the floor. Ah. Again, good morning. Um, for the record, my name is Sharon Carson, and I represent Senate District 14, comprising the towns of Londonderry, Hudson, and Auburn. And I have for your consideration this morning, Senate Bill 45, relative to National Guard benefits. Um, this bill allows eligible National Guard members to transfer their National Guard tuition waiver benefit to their spouse to be used in a degree-enhancing curriculum in the University System of New Hampshire. Um, Mr. Chairman, this bill is basically part two. Um, last year, we did this. We, um, we extended those um, educational benefits to the community college system. So uh, mostly as a recruitment tool, because if you have a member uh, who joins the National Guard and has no interest in going to college, but they're married and their spouse might be interested, they're now able to transfer that benefit to their spouse. 
And so all this bill does is adds the university system that, and it will allow their spouse to attend the, uh, our universities, whether it's UNH, whether it's uh, Plymouth State or Keene. So um, I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for the opportunity to present this bill. And uh, we'll, I look forward to working with folks on it if they wanna work on it. Thank you, Senator. Any questions? Seeing none, thank, thank you. you. So I think we will call up uh, General Nicolaitis next. He is in favor of the bill and wishes to speak. Thank you, sir, for coming in today. Thank you for your service. Hey, thanks, sir. Hey, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, I'm Major General David Nicolaitis, the Adjutant General for the New Hampshire National Guard, Commissioner, Department of Military Affairs and Veterans Services. As the Senator alluded to, this is part two. So let's go big and distill this and bring this down. I would suggest to you that the biggest threat to the United States and the Department of Defense is not China or Russia. It's our ability to fill our formations and make an all-volunteer force. Last year was our worst recruiting year for the Department of Defense since the end of the draft in 1972. There's no line at our door, right? So only 23% of today's youth is eligible for military service. So you look at the written testimony, the handout that I provided you. On the left-hand side is written testimony. I think on the right-hand side or the opposite is a six... Uh, six uh, PowerPoint slides that talk about um, the Department of Defense marketing campaign distilling down the propensity to serve of today's youth. So all the data is right there for you. So you look big picture, you know, there's no line at our door. So we have two levers, the accessions lever, which is trying to get kids to join, and the retention lever, which Senator Carson alluded to earlier. This is a retention tool. So we know service members get out after about nine years of military service. So what we're proposing is to expand this from the community college system of New Hampshire to the university system of New Hampshire, where a service member can transfer that education benefit to their spouse. So usually what we have a saying in the military is the service member volunteers and the family gets drafted. This is a first significant, hard, concrete benefit to give to a spouse. So when they're having those conversations at the dinner table, they say, you know, why are you getting out? So we know after a service member re-enlists after six years, they become eligible for this benefit. So it's either or, it's one or the other, it's not both concurrently. The service member has that tuition waiver, and if he so decides, he or she can transfer it to their spouse. Subject to your questions, that's all I have. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for coming in. Next we will have Kevin Grady from the State Veterans Advisory Committee, who is in favor. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the, of the committee, uh, my name is Kevin Grady. For the record, I'm a 25-year Air Force veteran, and I'm a 22-year veteran of the town of Hooksit. Uh, today, I'm here representing the uh, State Veterans Advisory Committee. And for those of you that may be new to government, <clears throat> we're actually uh, chartered by State RSA 115 colon A-8. Uh, to speak for the veteran community in New Hampshire, we have 20 uh, member organizations in the State Veterans Advisory Committee, and, and their names that, that should be familiar with you, uh, to you, the Disabled American Veterans, the, the American Legion, folks like that, um, the VFW. Uh, and full, full disclosure, we did not get the language on this bill in time for our 3 January meeting where we voted on the bills we did have the language on, but I'm, all, I'm always, my marching orders from the committee are, if we've supported something similar in the past, that I should go and tell you that, that we're gonna support this in the, the future. And we did unanimously support Senate Bill 360 last session that was signed into law by the governor that did the community college system, and we definitely will support this for the university system. Um, the, the, the retention part of this thing, I think sometimes people don't really understand how critically important that part of this is. Uh, I, my last assignment in the, in the Air Force, I was sitting behind a big desk in Germany, and I worked pilot management, you know, and, and for the Air Force and for, the, and for all the services, the commitment is 10 years after you graduate from pilot training, okay? Um, and, you know, to the personnel people that I was working with couldn't quite grasp the fact that, you know, if you've, if you've got somebody that's been around for eight to 10 years and has amassed all that experience, on paper, you can, you can train another person in that career field, but you know, to use a real world example, you traded away Tom Brady for the 199th pick in the draft in April and hope that that person is gonna turn out to be a Hall of Famer someday. So 
getting, getting the opportunity to retain that person, I think is really very, very important. And transferring this, this, this benefit uh, to a spouse is going to get that person from the, say, the mid-20s to early 30s when they're thinking about, you know, where am I really going to be long term? Am I going to put down roots in the community? We'd like for them to do it here. So I think this is a, is a win-win for the state, and it's a win uh, for the Guard. And, and as the general alluded to, every chance we get in the State Veterans Advisory Committee to say that, that you know, when one of us serves, the whole family serves. And this is our, our way of, of giving something back to the people that, uh, that help our, our folks that are in the Guard to serve. And subject to your questions, that's all I wanted to tell you this morning. Thank you for your testimony and your service. Any questions? Senator Gendro. So we extend it, and thank you for being here. Um, we extend it to a, uh, a spouse. Is there any opportunity in the future to even extend it to a child? Um, I think what, what, I don't want to put words in General Michaelitis's mouth, but I think what, what, what I would tell you on that is we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we're competing against ourselves. If we're trying to get people in the door to, to join the Guard and we're using the educational benefit as a reason to join the Guard, we don't want to give those folks say, well, my, my parents are in the Guard, so I don't have to join the Guard. I can just go to school on that educational benefit. How'd I do, sir? Go ahead. Come back up. <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm Ma'am, great question. So New Hampshire is the second state in the country to do this. Pennsylvania was the first in 2019. They did this both for their spouse and their child. We specifically chose not to transfer it to your child. And the reason why is 80% of new recruits come from the military family. It's, all, it's become a family business. So we don't want to cut off our nose or spot our face 20 years from now. Okay, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Any, any further questions for uh, Mr. Grady? Seeing none, thank you, right. sir. We appreciate it. Thank you, it. sir. All right, our final uh, person is Kathy Preventure from the University System of New Hampshire. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kathy Preventure. I serve as the Chief Administrative Officer and Vice Chancellor of Finance for our state's university system. I'm going to make this so quick. <laughs> the, uh, the university it. system fully supports Senate Bill 45, urge you to adopt, ought to pass. We have a 27-year partnership with the National Guard providing tuition waivers. Just in the last 10 years alone, we've provided benefits to 7,000 uh, guardsmen and women um, through six, over 600, cl 600 classes just in the last academic year, ending in June, to 352 guardsmen and women. That was about $2.6 million in tuition waivers. This is part of our public mission. We're proud of the partnership, and uh, we urge you uh, to pass. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. And the other uh, person I have on the list is Warren Perry, who uh, is signed in in favor. Anybody else wishing to speak? Seeing none, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 45. Welcome, Senator Lang. Uh, we're going to open the hearing on Senate Bill 49, and we will recognize Senator Lang to speak to his bill. Welcome to EDNA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee, for taking my testimony. Um, Senate Bill 49 comes out of a, a commission, a committee we had last, last term that I served on, uh, House Bill 330 or Senate Bill 330, I can't remember which. Um, and one of the recommendations out of that committee was um, this to create a dedicated fund and to put licenses and fees into a dedicated fund for use by OPLC. Um, this comes to the core of the uh, conversation about licensing and licensing fees. 
Um, this was never supposed to be a revenue stream for the state. It was supposed to serve the licensees to be able to regulate and provide consumer protections to make sure we have licensed and regulated people um, doing services in the state. Um, Um, so what this bill does is create a dedicated fund, takes all those licenses and fees which run the Department of, uh, which run OPLC because um, they're a self-funded agency, and returns any overage, any lapse back to this dedicated fund to be used by the agency in the next biennium for various functions. If they have capital expense functions, they could utilize any any lapse for the purposes of you know, so they don't have to drive up license costs again because they have a capital expense. Um, it could also be used by OPLC to drive down the second the second uh, biennium's licensing fees because we have too much money. So what I've just passed out to you are the lapses that have occurred. Um, in this last uh, biennium that just passed, we put $6.7 million into the general fund that doesn't serve a single licensee. They're paying the, the, f the fees in, in registration fees and renewal fees and then the money is just dumped into the general fund. It doesn't serve the licensees. So the goal here is to make sure that the money that the licensees pay go to serve and regulate the licensees or goes to pay down um, the cost of licenses by using the surplus. And that's it. Thank you, Senator. Any questions? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator perkins Quoker. Yeah, just a quick one. Thank you, Senator, for bringing this. And, um, you know, I fully support the intent. I just noticed that... Uh, you know, in the fiscal note that there's expected to be six and a half to eight million in the next fiscal year that will go into the fund. So this is, um, it's, you know, proposed to be sort of an ongoing thing that these funds are retained. Do we need that much money to lower fees or? <laughs> so again, so this gives the agency the ability to um, adjust, right? So if they realize, oh, we have a there's two other things that go on here is that we also changed last year that the lapses in OPLC will occur biennially instead of annually. Okay. And so instead of seeing it like you do now with an annual breakdown, it'll be at the end of two years, there'll be one number rolled over. Um, but again, what we'd see here is that we would be able to reduce license and fees by potentially seven point or six point seven million dollars, whatever that number was. Yeah, six point seven million dollars if we in, o, in OPLC, they be their responsibility for allocated to the appropriate board for that and, and allow that board to make recommendations on license fee changes. But um, but again, the goal here is to make sure that the people that are paying the bill and are, are, are doing this again, we, we set the fee schedule and we had a, pretty sure it was a court case that talked about the fact that it can't be, it's not a revenue generating function. It's supposed to be just enough to cover your operational costs and we are exceeding that. So we want to roll that back money in so that they can lower licensing and fees. Okay. Thank you. Senator Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's good to see you again, Senator. We <laughs> served on this uh, committee together. Um, Pretty comprehensive. We've worked hard um, to get this. And I, I hope the committee members understand that there's two pieces of legislation. Um, one of the things that we dealt with was who has the authority? And that really was the, the crux of the issue with Senate Bill 333. Um, and so there's a companion bill that's coming over from the House. I believe it's um, sponsored by uh, Representative Mc Carol McGuire that deals with the policy. And one of the things we learned was that fee structure, they were all over the place. Each board was allowed to set its own fees. We have what's called the 125% rule, which says you cannot charge more than 125% of your actual cost. And that's one reason why we have a lot of these overages. And one of the things that we did in the companion bill was we gave the authority to set the fee by OPLC. So OPLC will be setting all the fees. Everyone will be all with underneath that 125% uh, rule. So what you're seeing here as overage, I'm predict I think there's a prediction that you're going to see that go down because the costs are going to more accurately reflect mm -hmm. um, what the actual cost is. So that way the person that is paying the fee is paying an appropriate amount amount, not an overage. If there is an overage, that money should not go to the general fund. It should be used specifically for the purpose of um, the board. Whatever that is, to lower a fee or there's something else that needs to be done. 
um, because right now, if you you could say that I think we had a discussion about how these members were actually being subjected to double taxation, and we don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's just a background, and just kind of keep that under your hat when you're thinking about this bill, that there's a companion bill coming over from the House that deals with the board structure and fees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so oh, uh, Senator, Senator Carson is exactly right that the... <clears throat> You'll see uh, Representative McGuire is a co-sponsor of this bill. We worked together on it to make sure it came out of that committee. It was unanimous out of that commission that, that there were three legislative actions that needed to occur. This was one of them. Um, and you will see a bill coming over from um, Representative McGuire that talks about the fact that, again, we had one instance where in the law we said the board has the right to set fees. And then we have another instance where the director of OPLC has the right to set fees. And so what do you do with that? Um, and so the bill coming over from uh, Representative McGuire cleans up all of that in all of those boards and languages that are going on, along with some other minor recommendations from the commission. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Senator. Appreciate you coming over. All right, next we have uh, Lindsay Courtney from OPLC speaking in favor. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Lindsay Corney. I'm the executive director of the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification. I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 49. I think Senator Ling and Senator Carson gave you a, a nice overview of what the intent of the bill um, is it, it, supposed to do. Um, I'm just here to offer any information um, that may be of assistance to you. Um, I know, Senator, um, you asked a question about the lapse dollars. The one thing that I wanted to point out in 2019, in addition to the fact that different regulatory agencies were setting fees, is that executive branch agencies were directed to cut expenditures, and because we um, lapsed lapsed money into the general fund, we were part of that directive. So our lapse was particularly large because of uh, because of the state of uh, finances at that point in time. I don't anticipate our lapse to be that large this year. Uh, it looks like we're looking at about $1.2 million. Uh, but happy to answer any questions you may have. I don't want to take up any more time if you don't. Actually, I have one. Thank Absolutely. Thank you for coming in. So being new to this committee, I'm still learning a lot about OPLC and, and how it all works. But so if, you, um, if we establish this fund and you end up with some money in it, do, what would you envision would be what you would do, what would be the priority for using that money? Would it be lowering fees to the applicants? So certainly there's a need to level set fees. Some are way too high, some are not nearly high enough um, because they're not covering their costs. So we do need to level set the fees. Um, and I don't think that it needs to be upwards of 125% probably around the 110% range. In terms of capital projects, uh, the, the two things that I envision is one, um, you know, we have a contract on the agenda today with Governor and Council, um, procurement of new technology. Thankfully, we were able to secure some ARPA funding, but at some point, assuming that contract's approved, we're going to need to be able to pay for a new system. Um, and rather than jacking up licensing fees when we need to do a procurement, a dedicated fund would allow us to essentially save money um, for a long-term um, contract. The other is uh, we're working, um, we're beginning of stages, anticipating that our lease will be up in eight years of, you know, where do we go for building space? Right now our rent is really high um, because we're in lease space. It's about 800000 a year. Um, so obviously we'd like to come up with a more, um, a, a better solution that's uh, less expensive for our licensees. But other than that, we do anticipate um, being able to return some fees back to the licensees in terms of lowering fees. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Next, we will have uh, Stephen Rancourt from the ECBA who wishes to speak in favor. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Stephen Rancourt. I'm a licensed electrician. Hi, my name is Stephen Rancourt. I'm a licensed electrician in the state of New Hampshire and uh, executive director of the Electrical Contractors Business Association, and I'm here representing them as well. Um, we were very much involved with the subcommittee, the study committee over the summer, and um, what was going on. And we just had a 
couple of questions, concerns. We're, we're in favor of, with some concerns, I guess, is what I would say. The, and, and similar to what was just brought up and asked, is um, with the amount of money that may or may not be possibly in, this, in, the, in the fund at this point, would it be prudent to put something in the legislation that states that a percentage of this fund is put towards reducing licensing? so that it doesn't get cut away. Um, there's a large amount of money and it may be reduced a little bit based on what they're saying. We know that the overhead and overall expenses for the OPLC is increased dramatically from when it was joint boards. We understand that and, and we understand everybody has to pay their fair share, but we also don't want this 54 board, $17 million budget to get out of control on bureaucracy as well. And we hope that there's some oversight on that because whether they state, if you look at the line um, six on the uh, bill, and I don't know if it matters if it's in order or not, but they talk about it will be used to pay all costs and salaries, and then it talks about the remaining funds will be used for capital expenditures, operation of the office, and then licensing reduction. And um, Senator Carson, I'm sure you understand, we, we don't want to see this thing get out of control because we now have to have a lawyer at every meeting. We talk about it in a bunch of things. They want two more lawyers on another bill that's going to be talking about postings, just to be able to post things on time. So whatever the committee can do, we just ask that they consider making sure there's some safeguards in place so that it doesn't become, you know, if this much was left over, and I know Lindsay just um, testified that, there's not going to be much next, next year, next bill anymore. Right, where'd that money go? <laughs> They're using it, or I understand. And some of these capital expenditures, as a business person as well, if there's not an ROI on these, then it's great to do them because we are up with technology, but if it just costs us more money to do it, there needs to be some common sense. So I would just hope that the board would consider that. And then um, the, the fee structure we spoke about in the study committee was hopefully, there was supposed to be a formula that we talked about submitted. I don't know if that has been or will be, and that gets, we'll get, to an oversight committee at some point. We discussed that as well. So that this large bureaucracy and government agency is somewhat, is looked over and, and watched because there's not always going to be the same person appointed to direct it and everything else. So those are just the concerns we have. We're in favor of because we pay 125%, yet $3 million a year goes to the state and now they're telling us we don't have enough money, we have to double our licensing fee. So it's important and we do think it should be but I hope that the committee will consider some bumpers to guide that. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Senator Carson. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Chair. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, Mr. Ancourt. Good morning. Um, do you think it would be appropriate um, to have OPLC issue a report um, to the boards how the excess money was spent? Yeah, I think that would be important, and if there was some... Do they, they don't really have any say in it, though, now, the way all these laws are being changed, right? The, it still comes down to them, so that's our concern. We were, were hoping that the boards would have, it would be in cooperation with the OPLC. In other words, submit it, they look at it, they say, okay, here's our expenses, here's the overhead. Mm -hmm. But if they disagreed with it, I don't know if there's anything they can do about it based on the way that all the laws have changed for OPLC over the last couple of years, so that would be the concern. I, I understand your concerns, Mr. Rancourt, um, and we don't, unfortunately, we haven't seen um, Representative McGuire's bill yet, so I think that those concerns can be addressed when that policy comes over, but when it comes to these fees, um, one of the things that we talked about in the commission was really that there needed to be better communication between OPLC and the boards. And that's why I thought that it might be appropriate to require OPLC to report to the boards how that excess fund was being used. What was the money being spent on? What, if there was a capital project, how much money went towards that capital project? And if they are returning fees to the members, how much money was returned to the, uh, to the boards? Do you think that that would be appropriate? Yes, absolutely. That would be helpful and appropriate. Okay. And it would be helpful if it was prior to, because if they submit a budget, if they went to the boards before the budget was submitted to get their input, that would also be helpful, not just after the fact. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your time. That is all, all I have for testimony. I have 
Paul Menahan from the New Hampshire Hospital Association that signed in in favor. Adam Schmidt from the New Hampshire Association of Wheelters in favor. Rob uh, Chibar, Chibak, sorry, uh, from PFGF and HVAC who is in favor. And Sean Thomas from the New Hampshire Nurses Association in favor. Anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, we will close Senate Bill 49. Talk to Lindsay. Oh, that's your job. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you want me to? I'll talk to Lindsay. Because we worked on it. All right, we will open the hearing on Senate Bill 57, and in the absence of Senator D'Alessandro, we will ask Senator Perkins Quoker to introduce the bill. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoker, representing Senate District 21. Um, Senator D'Alessandro could not be here today, and he asked me to introduce SB 57, an act relative to the reduction in the calculation of state retirement annuities at age 65. I believe this is a refile of legislation from our good friend, Senator Kavanaugh from last year. I'm sure that there are folks behind me who can speak to some of the details in greater details, um, but I do have a couple facts to share about the bill. Um, the intent is to address at age 65, group one members in the retirement system get hit with a 10% reduction to their retirement benefit. A 10% reduction can make a significant impact to a retiree's benefit. Prior to 1988, Group 1 retiree benefits were linked to federal Social Security benefits, and a retiree's benefit was calculated using an equation taking both benefits into account. In 1988, the legislature removed this linkage but kept the 10% reduction. Now that the age of Social Security has risen to 67, Group 1 members are still getting hit with the reduction without receiving Social Security. Right now, an employee's benefit is 1 60th of their average final compensation prior to age 65. At age 65, it becomes 1 66th of their average final compensation. The intent of the legislation is to connect the 10% reduction to the age in which the member will begin to collect Social Security, so to reline up those two things. So while they are still hit with a 10% reduction, they will receive their Social Security benefit at the same time to offset this reduction. Aligning these will lessen the impact slightly. Um, I would offer to take questions, but I don't know much about this. So um, thank you very much, committee members, and I'll defer to those behind me. Thank, thank you. you. All right, next we will call up uh, Catherine, Catherine Heck from the New Hampshire Municipal Association who wishes to speak. Catherine, you didn't check a, a opposed or in favor, so. That's correct, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Catherine Heck, and I represent the New Hampshire Municipal Association, and I wanted to start by saying we don't have a position on the policy itself or the intent of the legislation. Um, we see that it, it does not contain a fiscal note yet at this time. We know from prior legislation that there was a cost to um, the employers, so cities and towns, and our members ask that we oppose legislation that increase employer contribution costs or increase the unfunded liability, which currently makes up 70 to 75 percent of the rates, because of course that's passed down onto the local tax bill. So we simply ask that the committee consider the fiscal impact when that information becomes available and your decision making on this legislation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank, thank you. you very Appreciate much. you coming in. All right, now we'll go to those in favor. Uh, Brian Hawkins from NEA New Hampshire, who wishes to speak in favor. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and welcome to the new EDNA members in the Senate. Um, it's good to be back in front of uh, Senate EDNA. Uh, for the record, Brian Hawkins, I'm here today uh, representing NEA New Hampshire. We represent over 17,000 uh, educators across the state, uh, primarily in K through 12 
uh, um, public schools. Um, and here today to testify in full support of Senate Bill 57. Um, in its, uh, I, I think Senator Perkins Quoka uh, captured a lot of the, the facts of the bill. Um, the, the couple of points that I would just add are that um, uh, back in 2011, when there were a number of changes made to the retirement system, one of the, and uh, excuse me, back in 2007, uh, they created the Decennial Retirement Commission. Um, when that commission had its uh, subsequent meeting in 2017, um, the commission uh, made several recommended changes to the retirement system, one of which was to pass uh, just this type of legislation, which was uh, to, to match up the fact that 65 is no longer the full Social Security age for fo folks who are in, um, in, in Social Security. Um, by way of uh, just so, sort of how meaningful this would be, I think to our members and eventual retirees um, in FY22, according to NHRS, the uh, average teacher pension was $23,173. Um, if in the employee group, which resides in uh, group one, also that um, average benefit was $15,005. So we are talking about modest uh, pensions here. Um, and so, you know, in, in taking some of those numbers, the, the, those potential extra year or two years potentially of that, that additional money before, the, before you hit uh, full Social Security age, would make a, a real difference when we're talking about the other things that happen at 65, getting older, Medicare premiums, prescription, you know, probably in, uh, increased prescription drug co costs and needs. And so, um, you know, having that uh, a, additional uh, time to maybe save some of that for, for those folks would be um, very meaningful. And uh, this was something the commission recognized that, you know, this was done back in 1988 when they set it at 65. And so it, we think it's common sense to, you know, let's, let's update this to uh, the reality that we're in today, which is, which is obviously a different age. So with that, I'll close my testimony and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we will call on uh, Marty Howland from New Hampshire Retirement Services. Welcome back to EDNA again. Thank you. Nice to see you all again. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure I'll see you next week, too. Uh, <laughs> for the record, my, my name is Marty Carlin, and I'm the uh, Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs at NHRS. Uh, the retirement system doesn't have a position on this bill as we view it as a policy decision for the legislature to make. Um, uh, Senator Perkins Coker did a, a good job on the backdrop of, of uh, when this was changed. Um, just, just in terms of Social Security eligibility, um, right now what people can begin collecting as early as 62 at a reduced amount for life or wait up until 70 and get a, a larger amount. But the, quote, full Social Security retirement age for anyone born after 1960 is age 67. Um, folks born prior to 1937 at 65 in that cohort in the middle uh, 23 years <clears throat> are eligible for their full age on a um, sliding scale, you know, between 65 and 67. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, the history is the history. The handout I, I provided uh, provides a little bit of the background, the same thing that the, the senator uh, mentioned when introducing it, and also sort of a sample calculation of how this would affect a member at age uh, 65. And this is a provision that is tied to the retiree's age. So if someone retires after 65, 65 or older, the, the less of the calculation with the 166, the visor, takes effect. If someone is eligible and retires, you know, between 60 and 65, they get that larger benefit until the month after they turn 65, and then our computer system, you know, 
<laughs> reduces that. Um, you know, we, we do provide notice when people retire and, and updates that this exists. Um, we, we mentioned it in all of our educational um, presentations as well, but you know, sometimes you see kind of mouths open, you know, when we, when we drop this in a member education session. So perhaps not all group one members are aware of it, you know, although we try to do that explanation. So, you know, as you know, there's two groups in, in NHRS, but group one is by far the largest group, um, you know, with about 87% of our 48,000 members. So, and, and there are folks who are working beyond age 67 now in various positions around the state, but I think it, um, there's at least 40,000 group one members who would be affected, you know, by this when they age into retirement eligibility. So um, just in terms of the scope, um, I think the bill on the um, website has the boilerplate fiscal note that it's not available yet. We actually just got this one, I think after new year's, but um, the, the way, um, this would be um, the way the actuary crunched the numbers is the, the any cost if this bill was adopted wouldn't show up until fiscal 26, 27. Our employer contribution rates have already been set for 24 and 25. So, um, you know, they projected this would increase um, rates by 0.18% uh, of payroll for employers and 0.26 for teachers. Uh, with a projected FY26 cost of uh, 1.2 million for the state and, and 5 million for political subs. There's also an unfunded liability piece to this because it would, you know, the folks who have been paying into the system based under the current law, you know, there's a little bit of bleed if, if they're retiring now and getting that larger benefit. That's about 45 million in unfunded liability. And that, that would either be paid off um, through employer contributions over 20 years or if the state opted to general fund that up front and, and do it that way. They did that, something similar uh, on a bill affecting group two last year. Um, so, and we view the bill as uh, prospective. So anyone who retires on or after the effective date would, um, this would affect them, but folks who are already retired, there's no you know retroactive application. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to cover. I'd be glad to answer any questions anyone on the committee may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning, Mr. Carlin. Are there any questions from the committee? Mr. Carlin, um, when we, we did have this bill last, the last biennium, um, and I believe, and I'll have to go back and look at my old bill file, that um, one of the reasons why we did not pass this was because we were outside the budget. Um, there were some significant costs, but we saw the merit in aligning this, yeah. and that's why we said, no, we'll, we'll take it up next year. So I just wanted to let the committee members know that that was the reason why this did not go forward, because there was a budget impact, and we, we were outside the budget. So. Yeah, there's been several similar attempts over the years yeah. to... to, to uh, pass similar bills, and I think they may have passed one chamber or the other, but never uh, made it to the finish line. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any further questions? Okay. Seeing thank none, thank you. Are there, um, Bob Blaisdell. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Bob Blaisdell, representing State Employees Association. Um, I know you're running behind schedule a little bit, um, so I'll be exceptionally um, brief. Um, I'm here um, submitting a letter authored by um, President Guller, Rich, Rich Guller, uh, in full support of the bill. Um, very briefly, it's, it's just uh, reestablishing a link that once created, uh, that, that was once, um, that was once, available um, to the state employees. Um, and uh, I'm not going to read the letter, but I just wanted to express our, our strong support uh, for the bill and happy to work with you and answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, I guess you get off okay. easy. Easy. <laughs> easy peasy. All right. I have uh, Glenn Brackett from New Hampshire, AFL-CIO in favor. Richard Guller from SEA in favor. And anybody else wish to speak? Seeing none, we will close the hearing on SB 57.
The pussy? Or... So you made it back. They were gentle on me over there. Oh, it was next door in whatever I was in. Uh, HHS. Oh, no, you meant from yesterday. I thought you meant from other places. <laughs> Say when. All right. Uh, we will now open up the hearing on Senate Bill 67 and recognize Senator Gannon. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the panel. Um, it's not a big amount of stuff, but um, this is a weighty measure. It's a little joke there. But I hope my testimony will measure up. Um, most of the stuff, oh, you know, you got to have liberty. Uh, most of the changes that were made, um, uh, Commissioner of Agriculture Jasper asked me to file this bill. And most of it is just changes that are in the National Conference on Weights and Measures Handbook. And that would be everything in black. The only controversial area, it seems, aligns 10 through 13. Um, and the two parties are two parties going to try to work that out to an amendable situation. Myself, I didn't really see the problem because I see an inherent conflict in having a technician who works for someone or a family member or anything like that. I see a problem if they have a monetary interest in them doing the certification. That's just me personally because um, I follow the money and that's usually where the problems lie. But if the parties behind me can agree my opinion and that doesn't really matter. So they are working on an amendment on that and I think that's the only controversial part of this bill are those three lines. Thank you, Senator. Any questions? Seeing none, appreciate Thank your Thank you very much. Have a great day, guys. I think we will uh, call up Commissioner Jasper next and have him give us some background thoughts and ideas on it. Welcome, Commissioner. Sorry about that. For the record, I am Sean Jasper, Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. And I appreciate your consideration of Senate Bill uh, 67. For the most part, these are clarifications. Uh, Director Ayer will speak more specifically to them. I just I wanted to speak to the policy. And while we still stand behind lines uh, 10 through 13, sometimes you run things up the flagpole and found, find out there are more uh, serious issues than we first realized. Um, I do believe there is a serious conflict in having uh, people who work uh, for the company that owns the devices, uh, having them certify them, but there's a tangled web. I, I believe it was Commissioner Taylor who, because of the lack of technicians within the department, asked for this language, not thinking of the unintended con consequences, the language should have made it clear at the time that you couldn't certify those devices. But we will work uh, with, a, with a group, hopefully over the summer, to come up with a, uh, a solution to this, this problem. But for now, we would ask that you amend uh, that new section of lines 10 through 13 out. Uh, if you go down, you'll, you'll see that a lot of it is just cleaning up language. And again, uh, Director Ayer will speak to it. But if you go to line 25, it says police powers, right of entry, and stoppage. Then you read the verbiage, and it's not clear in there. But obviously, that is the intent. That's what, how we've always taken it. So what this, this does is put in statute clear language that matches the title. Because that's, of course, when you're going into a grocery store, anybody can do that during hours. However, they could tell us the way the language is now that we needed to leave. Um, and we want to make that clear that we do have the right to be there when they are open for business to inspect their devices. On the next page, um, this is where it puts stop in. It's implied. And we're not talking lights and sirens. We're not. But if we come across a vehicle, um, because these are on the road all the time, particularly one that we may not recognize or may not be licensed, we could tell them they need to stay where they are. We will not be pulling people over. However, if somebody were to take off, we could then call law enforcement and say, you need to stop this vehicle so we can um, check their credentials and um, take them someplace where we can do the testing. Uh, that's, that's my testimony. 
I'd be glad to answer uh, any policy questions. Director Ayer will uh, be prepared to answer any technical questions you might have. Senator Carson. Good morning, Commissioner. It's Good always morning. a pleasure to see you. Um, I'm glad to hear that you are willing to take out sections, uh, take out on page one, lines 11, 12, 13, and 13. Um, my questions are dealing on page two, uh, beginning on line one, where it talks about stop and require any commercial vehicle equipped with weighing or measuring devices or bulk measured commodities. So are you talking about, say, a truck full of hay where or a someone who bought a cord of firewood, what exactly are you talking no, about? No, we're talking here? about um, trucks that are delivering fuel, um, whether that's propane or oil to homeowners. Mm -hmm. um, Director Ayers can speak more specifically to those, but those are any, any vehicle that has a device which we currently license. Mm -hmm. So um, that's all, all it is, and as, as you can see, the language in the heading actually talks about stopping, and that is, Director Air will tell you the, the language used to be more broad and allow us to stop any vehicle. Mm -hmm. That got taken out, and then this language should have been inserted in its place because we have to have the authority to be able to verify. Um, Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm trying to envision this. How would you stop a vehicle, or are you targeting a particular vehicle or company, right, yeah, we, we, or you're just randomly selecting a fuel truck that happens to go by, we, and you're going to stop yeah. them? Director Air will speak to that, but in more specific. But if we saw a, a home, a, a truck, perhaps from Massachusetts, and we said that that company is not registered, and that has happened, where people come over the border with. Uh, fuel oil trucks to deliver home heating fuel or propane, they're not registered in New Hampshire, but they're operating illegally in New Hampshire. We wouldn't pull them over. We don't have the ability to pull them over. We don't want to get into that. But stopping refers to the fact that where they are, they're, they're at somebody's house. We could tell them they need to stay there. And that's really the definition of stopping in this case. However, if they said, now see you later, we could call whatever police and say, this vehicle has just, we had the authority to stop them. They took off. You now need to, to make the stoppage. They're trying to get back to Massachusetts. You know, we need, we need to be able to figure out. Um, thank you for answering the question. I just have one last question because I want to try to envision how this is, how this is going to work. Someone is at someone's home. They're getting a delivery of, say, home fuel, heating oil, and that's where you're going to stop them, is at the point of delivery, not out traveling on the road someplace. No, ab absolutely not. We don't have okay. the ability to do that. I am not going to authorize lights and sirens, but it, I, I'll turn, you know, have you go back to that line 25 on the previous page, right of entry and stoppage is in the current statute. Right. It is implied. We have that, but then the specific language isn't there. So this is, okay. I view, as a cleanup to make the statute match the intent. Okay. Thank you. Senator perkins Quoker. Yeah, I think Senator Carson mostly addressed my concern, but I guess I was also just wondering, in terms of the police powers to start in line 25, um, are you having issues with this? Like, are you guys entering on premises and, and being... Director Air can speak to that. I don't <laughs> okay. believe so. Okay. We're trying to clean up the statute so you know, we're in line with national standards. Um, this verbiage pretty much word for words comes out of the NIST handbook for what's recommended. And again, it's implied that we're there, but it, it's not. And so going into the statute, the best thing to do, we felt, was to clean it up. The primary purpose was probably those lines I'm asking you to remove, but, um, but we will work on that another day. Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Gendron. Thank you. In my simplistic mind, I've got to go back to the oil truck. So the oil truck is at my house. What the concern is, I think I'm getting a gallon of heating fuel. The possibility is I'm not getting a gallon of heating fuel. Is that, that 
premise there? That, that is exactly correct, Senator. As a matter of fact, we just settled with a, a company that we discovered that two of their trucks were doing just, just that. Um, and the way the certifications work, we, we will go back to the last, to when they were certified, and we settled with them. Uh, and our primary concern was not getting a fine for the state. It was making the customers whole. And so based on the amount those meters were off, those people who had deliveries in that period of time uh, received a refund. There was a small fine. Um, it was obviously, there's a lot of state uh, time taken up here. It doesn't come to us um, per se. But um, so, yes, I mean, what we're about is consumer protection here. That's our primary concern. So, Commissioner, this has actually spawned a question for me on line two of page two. The or bulk measured commodities is pretty broad. It doesn't necessarily define it, at least by my reading, to fuel oil trucks or it could be a uh, truckload of sweet corn. It, it is considered but, a commodity and it would be it is sold in bulk measurement. So I guess I'm, I'm just thinking, are we putting in something that may, uh, and, and it certainly falls under the purview of, of weights and measures for, for consumer protection. Director Ayer would be better speak to that. That okay. is certainly not the intent, and there may be a definition within I fully statute. understand that, but as I'm reading it, yeah. I'm seeing how it could be, you know, construed to mean that. Yeah, and I'm not sure that, you know, I know what you're, you're saying. Yeah. You know, my when I used to del deliver manure, it was, you right. know, 10 yards, you know. Exactly. So, um, Director Ayer will, sp will speak to that. Okay. And, but certainly that's not our intent. I am not aware of us ever s stopping a truck uh, with farm commodities on it. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. I think that leads us to call up Director Cheryl Ayer, who wishes to speak in favor. Morning, Director. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you today. For the record, my name is Cheryl Ayer. I am the Director of Weights and Measures, which is under the Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. I am here to speak in support of parts of the Senate six, Bill 67. The first proposed change provides clarification of authority for us to charge for services provided by the state's metrology lab that are already in rule. The second paragraph can be seen in lines 10 through 13. The intention of this change was to provide for protection to the citizens of our state. The idiom, the fox guarding the hen house, is an old one and means someone has been put in charge of something that is too tempting for them to ignore. My testimony today in no way proposes that, that, that this is happening. Yet, we often put laws or boundaries in place so as to eliminate the perception or opportunity for fraud. Prior to 1989, inspections of weighing and measuring devices were conducted solely by the Department of Agriculture. Due to budget cuts and the loss of inspectors, the commissioner, by rule, delegated device inspection to the private sector. In July 2011, this pra practice was codified into law by the legislature. As a side note, New Hampshire and Kansas are the only states with fully privatized inspection service of commercial weighing and measuring devices. The unintended consequence of privatization of commercial device inspection is the loss of impartiality. The division is motivated by the principle of equity in the marketplace. Private industry, by its nature, is motivated by the bottom line. What does the customer and the business competitor seek and demand? I believe we can all agree that it is equity. If the legislature desires to eliminate the perception of partiality in this arena, it should prohibit businesses from calibrating and inspecting their own equipment. <clears throat> Let me rephrase that. From certifying and inspecting their own equipment. 
Unfortunately, the proposed le legislative change may help to mitigate one problem, but exacerbate another problem of trying to define which service technicians are wholly or partially affiliated with a business enough to have monetary interest in the outcome of the certification. Who would make that judgment call? Also, all privatized service technicians have a monetary interest since they are being paid by the businesses to certify their commercially used weighing and measuring devices. We currently have a good working relationship with the service companies and the service technicians. We acknowledge that there are both pros and cons to having service technicians licensed to certify in behalf of the state. Unfortunately, in addition to the desire to eliminate impartiality, we lose out on neighboring states recognizing New Hampshire certification since the technicians applying certification are not unbiased parties. We have three weights and measures investigators to cover the whole state. Currently, we have 210 licensed service technicians, which is down 25% from 2017 when we had 280 licensed service technicians. This puts a burden on the service companies to work quicker and more efficiently. When we audit businesses, there's often no way of knowing if equipment has been properly tested. If we find equipment out of compliance, we will often contact the service technician who performed the last certification. If they affirm that it was in good working order and condition at the time they certified it, the responsibility lies with the company to have the device serviced and left in a correct condition. With this proposal, there are too many details to consider and too many unanswered questions as how we would carry it out. We recommend amending the bill and removing the new language in lines 10 through 13 until a viable solution can be supported by individuals with a vested interest. The changes for lines 16 through 19 are just housekeeping to provide clarity. For the changes to RSA 438.15, the right of entry is not specified. In another statute, RSA 438.10, which is titled General Testing, right of entry is implied, but not specifically given. Right of entry is language used by jurisdictions throughout the country. We have been given the authority to test weighing and measuring devices, but it does not give us, the, give us the right of entry. I also believe that in line 29, after the additional language, there needs to be a comma after the word hours. Proceeding to the second page, the language in lines one through three provides the authority to investigate and inspect devices on commercial vehicles. We have fuel delivery meters for home heating fuel, lubricants, and bulk deliveries of wood pellets, for example. Prior to 2012, there was language in the statute that was too broad. It allowed us to stop any vehicle, which was not the intent. So that language was removed. We feel that a clarification of language needs to be added back into, the, into this regulation for these types of devices. Please be assured that it is not our intent to physically pull over trucks in the course of their business. Our agency does not have lights and sirens on our vehicles, nor are we proposing to add them. If we choose to speak with a delivery driver that was stopped, this would give us the opportunity to detain them while an inspection of the meter or license is conducted, or scale as it may be with a bulk delivery. If fraud is, expect, is suspected and the driver refuses to cooperate, this language would give us the authority to work with local law enforcement. This language is also very similar to language used by other jurisdictions throughout the country and is part of the proposed model law in NIST Handbook 130. NIST stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology, which we work very closely with in the National Conference on Weights and Measures. It is not like a vehicle scale at a lumber yard or a deli scale that stays in one place. These vehicles are usually on the move. I want to assure you that the investigators that are working with the Division of Weights and Measures right now are very respectful to both the individuals 
and the companies which we regulate. They will often call me before any enforcement action to verify what actions should be taken. We are not in the business of an interrupting the normal flow of business without a cause. The last change has to do with our own state field standards. When the original language was written, we were using brass standards in the field that were not as stable as the stainless steel standards used today, and which have been documented um, and have a history of stability. That is the conclusion of my testimony. Thank you for your time and consideration of the approval of Senate Bill 67 with the amendments we have proposed. Thank you, Director. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any questions for the director? Senator Carson? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Ms. Ayers. Good morning. Um, I'd like to speak to the police powers section here. Yes. Um, and the proposed amendment, and I want to make sure that there's enough protection here for anyone who is going to um, be subject to the police powers because you're, you have the ability to arrest without formal warrant, uh, which is basically a warrantless arrest. Um, and I want to make sure that there are enough protections in place. Um, do your inspectors carry a weapon? We do not. You do not. Okay. And may I follow up, Mr. Yeah. Chair? Um, what do you do if you go into a grocery store and it's like Hannaford's or Shaw's or something or Damula's and the person working the cashier at the cashier station is the person that's weighing, say someone's got a bag of apples or something, um, and is a minor, is maybe 15 years old because kids can work in a grocery store at age 15. Are you going to arrest that minor? Absolutely not. Maybe never, so. never would that happen. What are the protocols in place? If you do have protocols, are they in rules or... Um, it's just, just something that you informally do. Well, all the investigators that are working for the division, they have gone through the police academy, mm -hmm. the part-time academy. Um, I have to say that since I have been working with the, the division, we've never had a situation where we would arrest someone without a, a long investigation, working with local law enforcement. It, it sounds really um, like it gives us a lot of authority, but in the time that I've been here, um, as far as the situation where that you've um, provided or the scenario, we have never ever, like, on a whim, just arrested someone. Okay. And I have to say that when um, when our investigators are going into a business. And we are looking at, you know, is there, is there a behavior here that isn't in line with the, the laws and rules? Um, we always, we educate, educate, educate. And we provide them information on how they, are, they need to correct an action before we ever take any other steps forward. Um, we're always going to um, inform them give them a means to correct the action. We're always going to make sure that they fully understand what needs to happen. And then if they continue a behavior that is not in line with the, the statute or the rules, then that's when we'll give them a notice of administrative fine. And then they're informed they are allowed the, the ability to have an informal proceeding or a formal hearing in a in that situation and never do we really go beyond that I mean it would have to be really egregious for us to do that the most important piece of the legislation that we need changed is that right of entry though okay. I hope I I hope I answered your your question um, yes you did um, so you're telling us that you can go into a store and if an inspector it's blatant right in front of him or her that they're not going to arrest someone that they see breaking the law, that they're going to say, wait a minute, I see what's going on here. What you're doing is wrong. We're going to educate you, um, so on and so forth. Exactly. And, and we usually let 
the person that is in charge of that establishment know that we are there, we introduce ourselves before we do any, any action in their, in their business anyway. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions? I, I guess I'm gonna go back to the question that I asked of, of the commissioner and uh, the or bulk measured com commodity section the more I read it, the more wide open it seems to me, because I can envision quite a few different, could be a truckload of silage corn that's sold right off the field, could be uh, most anything, and I, that's giving me a little bit of heartburn the more I read it. <laughs> okay, so. so if you look, it says, um, require any commercial vehicle equipped with weighing and measuring devices. Or bulk Ma measured corn. And, and maybe there needs to be some clarification in that language because I can understand what you mean. Yeah. But bulk weighing devices, we do have pellets that are delivered mm -hmm. using a bulk weighing device, which is a scale that's on the back of a, a truck. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the, the things that we wanted to address. I, I understand. I think the, the comma, then the or bulk measured commodities makes it a whole separate thought. Okay. That's my concern. Yep, and, I can and understand that. I think that. that is very wide open. So I, I think we might want to look at that a little bit further. Just just my thoughts. Okay. Any other, uh, Senator Altshuler. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> with respect to your um, question, which is different from mine, perhaps a change of the word or to be with might might alleviate some of the heartburn maybe but just or a thought. or we just leave out bulk measured commodities because weighing and measuring devices would include those those scales that are used I, to I deliver agree. those bulk products I, I think the or bulk measured commodities means something that is weighed and measured with a different device and there's no weighing device on the vehicle that, that's the way I would interpret it. Well, there would also be situations where um, we've had we've had complaints regarding the the sale of mulch, let's say, mm -hmm. and at at some places they're selling that mulch by the yard. We have gone out on investigations to determine if the correct number of yards have been delivered. If we had a a business, you know, now that we're talking about this more, if we had a business that we had investigated and we determined that they weren't giving the correct amount of volume to their customers, then maybe in the course of our investigation, we would want to detain someone who is making a bulk delivery for a company and measure the amount of volume that is on that truck. Now, it is not a specific device. It's not a device that's, that's licensed with our division, and that would be a circumstance. I guess I would liken that to a cord of wood. There's specific criteria for measuring a cord of wood and what's what's required to be offered. Correct, so. and we do we do follow up on consumer complaints regarding the measure of cord wood. Senator also did you have more questions? I'm uh, sorry. Yes, I sort of stepped in the middle. There no, that's no, that, that's fine. There's a lot to talk about. Um, I I think f I I will admit that um, I. I was given pause because I actually, until being on this committee and reading this legislation prior to today, was unaware that there was a state agency that had uh, special police powers. Um, and frankly, I'm kind of surprised that there aren't a lot of people here, you know, who would be in other committees usually with their hair on fire about this. So, um, I'm I'm just trying to wrap my brain around what you had just testified to that your agency's inspectors have I guess a protocol of education and follow up prior to an escalation of like we've we've dealt with this like we've talked to you 18 times about this and you're still doing it and so now we're going to have to enact our special police powers is that's do I understand that that's your protocol? Yes. Okay. Although although we probably wouldn't let something go on 18 times. I understand. I'm sorry. I'm being hyperbolic. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Um, so when 
if I understand this, to arrest without a formal warrant. It just, are you talking about actually taking someone into custody? And how does this, I really don't understand this. Okay. Could you so, explain it a little more? Um, Thanks. When I was when I was um, first hired as an investigator, I myself went to the police academy, and I really felt that like the training may not be exactly what I was going to be doing as an investigator for the division of weights and measures, but it gave me skills and know how how to protect myself and to make sure that I wasn't going beyond the scope of of my job description. In, I was I was hired in 2009 to be an investigator, and since that time, there's only been a couple times that um, anybody has ever been arrested, and that was with someone who actually was a firewood dealer, and we had had multiple people who had been um, scammed, and um, we actually. In one circumstance, we actually worked with the AG's office with their investigator. And um, what came out of that was the fact that the AG's office took over and there was a felony charge involved with that because he had taken $3,000 of someone's money and not delivered any firewood. But there were all these other um, individuals who had, who had been affected by that. And... Um, they were arrested. Um, when we go to a local police department or whatever, when we're following up on a consumer complaint, and it usually happens with um, firewood, unfortunately, um, because we have the authority to have this, and we've been to the police academy, and we're, we're licensed part-time certified police officers, they take what we say and they are willing to help us in that investigation. And so it sounds a lot harsher than it really is because we are going to take the, the best route that is not gonna be um, showing up in the news or is going to take someone that we haven't done a thorough investigation on. It's, it's, there is so much prior um, investigation that goes in before anything like that would ever happen. And it's not done without, um, without consulting with the commissioner, without, you know, talking to other law enforcement. And since I have to say, I, I became director in 2019. We have not had any arrests since that time. We have done all of our, um, administrative we've all we've done it all administratively rather than criminally thank you senator carson <clears throat> thank you mr chair i would like to just um speak to senator altschiller's question about the police powers um i believe it was back in 2011 and 12 we actually changed that and it was based on complaints that we had received from the public about the actions of some of the investigators. They did carry guns, and um, there really wasn't a very defined set of protocols in place. And what we did do is we took the guns away, and we uh, mandated that their inspectors go to the police academy. So that, I think, is something that has worked great, and they have developed protocols. And I feel very comfortable with what you do because I follow, because I did that work, I follow up with, uh, and I read the reports that you were, you, you were required to give, but you're no longer, you no longer give. Um, so I feel comfortable, but I wanted to bring that issue up to the committee members um, because as the chair of judiciary, we had a bill yesterday with warrantless arrests. And so sometimes people feel a little uncomfortable and it probably warranted a discussion. But I can assure you that the, the protocols that they have developed are working. Their inspectors are extremely professional. I've gotten no complaints 
whatsoever about the behavior of the inspectors. So I want to applaud Commissioner Sh Jasper as well as Director Ayers for mm -hmm. making those needed changes that need to be in place. I think, in my opinion, the biggest problem with this bill is there's a lot of, um, it's not clear. And okay. there's a lot of work that needs to be done on it. But okay. um, again, I want to commend you for the work that you have done thank you so much. with concerning the police powers. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Seeing none, I guess we put you through the test. So we'll let All you right. go for now. Thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate your testimony. All right, next we have uh, Peter Brennan from the New England Convenience Stores, who is opposed to the bill and would like to speak. Good morning. Welcome. Would it be possible for a member of ours, Floyd Hayes, to join us as well? Sure, absolutely. I do have some written testimony here. What, what Good was morning, it, what Mr. Was his Chairman. Name and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what was his name again? Floyd Hayes. Floyd Hayes. Oh, okay. So, yeah. The next speaker on the list, I believe. Yes. All right. I got you both. Uh, so for the record, my name is Peter Brennan. I'm the executive director of the New England Convenience Store Energy Marketers Association. Um, my left is Floyd Hayes, who runs Aranco Oil. He's uh, here to answer any technical questions that you might have. Um, I'd just like to agree with the previous three speakers that we think that uh, lines 10 through 13 should be deleted from the bill. Um, our reasons are, uh, are detailed in the letter that I supplied, but essentially we have members that uh, calibrate their own fuel dispensers. They have employees that do that. Um, these employees are well trained. They're, they're um, you know, certainly not going to cheat the system just because their employer um, in, pays their you know, check every week. Uh, they know what their job is, and we think that the state has recourse if there are improperly calibrated fuel dispensers, um, other weights and measures devices currently. So this, um, this seems like it might be uh, a solution in search of a problem. Um, as the previous speaker mentioned, not aware of any enforcement actions recently um, involving fraudulent or improper calibration. Um, I'm not aware of any with our members in New Hampshire so um, yeah, we're, we're opposed to that language. Um, we're happy to further discuss with uh, the sponsor and the commissioner. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them or um, Mr. Hayes is happy to answer them if he can as well. Certainly. All right, any questions from the committee? Senator Altshuler. Um So thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking at your testimony and I was listening. Um, I, I, this is just a, if you have a technician who has this particular skill and do they do other jobs that, you know, or I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm wondering if a technician has this skill, can they not offer that skill to a different company? Well, I think, or do um, they, and I'm going to have Floyd jump in in a second, but uh, there are third-party providers yeah. for these services, and then some companies have them in-house. And my understanding is that it really depends on the size of the business, whether you have these people in-house or you get a third-party service to do it. So, yes, if they have these skills, could they offer them to another company? Yeah, and then, then they would just work for the um, third-party vendor, I believe. I see. Oh, I see. So there, um, I follow up. there are sure. third-party vendors that just employ technicians. I believe so. Is that, yes. I see. Okay. Thank you. I'm just looking for the structure of how this all yeah, works. Boy, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Senator Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is for Mr. Hayes. Good morning, Mr. Hayes. Good morning. It's a pleasure to see you again. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to page two, um, beginning on line two, where they're asking you to at the stop and require any commercial vehicle and the issue of bulk measured commodities. As someone who supplies oil um, and gas to gas stations, um, how often do you calibrate your trucks? Well, Senator uh, Carson, thank you for the question. Uh, Aranco Oil did out of the, uh, I think, 
those kind of they got out of the fuel oil distribution business years ago. But I think about at least eight foot of the balance sheet of membership that's not here that is in that business. They're required to calibrate, I believe, once a year. Mm -hmm. Calibrate to make sure if we get whatever the gallons are, it comes out accurately. As far as the solutions, uh, and what the commissioner and the director was talking about, I would have them seriously look at the Department of Environmental Services, how they address, I, I would call it a similar issue called red tag. So instead of the police powers or whatever the changes they make here, a simple red tag. For example, all of my service stations every year are inspected by the Department of Environmental Services for the systems. If any one of those systems are off and they're not addressed within 45 days, the state shows up, came over to inspect it, put the red tag on it because nobody can introduce any product into the system. If you do, there's a fine structure. So in the event of the examples the commissioner and the director alluded to, if you pulled over that truck at your fuel oil, at your home delivering fuel that's not supposed to be there, instead of detaining the person, red tag the vehicle, take the plate number, the name of the company, call for law enforcement. That would be the simple solution to that. If they continue to distribute fuel after the red tag is put on the meter, then that company and that person and their driver mm -hmm. will be held accountable, just like it is on the DES side at service stations throughout New Hampshire. So for example, if my location in Manchester, New Hampshire was red tagged, and I called an out-of-state person to come deliver fuel into me, and they introduced, we'll say, a, a load of gas, 11,000 gallons, I would be on the hook, as well as that company would be on the hook, as well as the brand. So it was Exxon fuel, Citco fuel, Shell fuel, all of them were on the hook for that. And that system that the DES has been extremely effective in making sure that the systems within New Hampshire are tight as far as underground storage tanks, lines, and pumps from leaking into the environment. Very effective, very easy to administer. And there's a trail, it's a paper trail. The only difference is they don't detain, there's no detention. Follow up, Follow up. No, uh, just thank you for explaining that for the committee, uh, Mr. Floyd. We really appreciate that. So, Mr. Floyd, this essentially is the same as an outer service order on a truck put out by the you know, Department of Safety or something like that. It, it takes that equipment out of use. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. We appreciate you coming in today and your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. So the only other one I have on here is Kyle Baker from the New Hampshire the Grocers Association who is opposed and does not wish to speak. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Seeing none, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 67. So we have a few minutes here. Are there, I think there's some bills we could exec. So look for, okay. okay. Yeah, we, we've all got meetings. So 1155, you're good till then? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that we go into executive session. Do I have a second? second. I have moved and seconded. Okay. Um, I would like to um, first discuss. Oh, Senate. I guess we got a vote on it then. Oh, All in favor? sorry. Aye. 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 Sorry. I'm still getting used to that process. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I'm getting used to a lot of things too. Um, okay. Senator Mr. Cass. Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to suggest that we uh, take up Senate Bill 42 FN. And I would like to make a motion of what to pass. Do we have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Senator Gensel. Uh, Senator Carson, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this, again, was a bill that was heard last year. There were some problems with it. And um, Senator Whitley and Senator D'Alessandro um, worked on this issue. And they came up with a resolution that I think we can all support. And so that's why I've made the ought to pass motion. Any further uh, comments from the committee? Seeing none, we have the motion is ought to pass on Senate Bill 42. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move consent. Uh, second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 I guess, do we all need our mics on for this? At least, I think we're all supposed to have our mics on. For this yeah. Session, if so. we're, okay. so, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I will be responsible for the blurb. Thank you. So you'll take it out? Yep. Senator Carson Unless will take it out. Senator Perkins Coker would like to do yeah, it. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. okay um, Mr. Chair, I think we could probably take up Senate Bill 45, 
And I would like to make an ought to pass motion on that as well. So we have a second. Okay. Seconded by Senator Gendro. Senator Carson, you recognize the speech. Thank you. Um, this bill is just, as, as testimony alluded to, the second half of this. Um, it is a recruitment tool for the, um, uh, for the National Guard. And I think it's great if we can transfer those benefits and the university system is in, in favor of it. So I would like to, again, recommend ought to pass on Senate Bill 45. Any other comments? I uh, will just add that I was, uh, this is a new area for me, and I was certainly uh, impressed with the testimony we had and, and in favor of the concept. I think it makes complete sense. So with that, we will uh, take a vote. All those in favor of ought to pass on Senate Bill 45? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And who would like to take it out? Mr. Chair, I'd like to move consent calendar. Okay. Uh, second. We have moved and seconded on consent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now who would like to take it out? I will because it's mine. Actually, I guess you don't have to take it out if it's on consent, do you? No, we have, we're responsible for like a little blurb okay. kind of a statement. So right. I'll with Phil and we'll come up with some blurbs so we can get them in the calendar. Um, Senate Bill 49, we talked about doing an amendment to. We, yeah, we'll have would to. Would you like to talk to OPLC before we do that? Yes, Mr. Chair. I, I would also like to take a look at what is hopefully going to come over from um, the House. Okay. So I'd like to look at Representative McGuire's bill, but um, I am in support. We do need an, an amendment, and um, I'll, I'll be happy to work with you on that. Okay. Senate Bill 57. I would... Uh, are we comfortable with that? Everybody comfortable with that bill? Is there any motion on it? Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move on to pass on Senate Bill 57. Second. And it's moved and seconded by Senator Perkins Corker. Uh, Senator Carson, would you like to speak to that? Yes, thank you. As I mentioned during um, our discussion, we had, um, we had this bill, in fact, last year that came in front of the committee. And the main reason why we did not take it up was because of the fact we were outside of the budget cycle. As you can see, there is a significant cost here, and so we figured we would take it up again this year. Um, this is parity. It is bringing people up. This affects group one, which are our teachers, and we know that our teachers um, get the lowest uh, amount in retirement pay. So their, being, their, their amount is being reduced. And so in order to be fair, we should just align it with the 67 yeah. as the federal government. So it is an issue of fairness. Are we okay, though, with not knowing what that would mean at the municipal level, what um, the cost would be? If you look at the level, uh, if you look at the information from um, Mr. Carlin, I believe he mentions $45 million, and that's why it was in the budget. And if we put it, if it does go into the budget, it is something that we can, uh, we can either fully pay for, or, uh, you know, we'll we'll figure it out. But it will go to finance, and that's where they'll figure it out. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I guess my comment on it is that it appears the intent of the original 10% uh, penalty, if you want to call it that, or devaluation, was because it aligned up with the taking of uh, Social Security benefits and. Once that that number has changed, then it does seem like an unfair penalty, since that was the original intent mm -hmm. of the legislature. So I would support moving this back to its original intent. Any further comments? No, sir. Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Did, um, I make a motion for the consent calendar. We have a second. Second. Moved and seconded for consent. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I can take it out, Chair. Senator Perkins Coker okay. will take it out. My feeling is the remaining bills we have, Senate Bill 44, 49, and 67, I'm not feeling comfortable that we're ready to exec those at this point. Does the rest of the committee agree? Thank you. Okay. I'd accept the motion to come out of exec. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. And with that, I think we are done with our business for today. Yes. All Thank right. You. So the committee is dismissed. Thank you. All. Thank you, Senator Pearl. Senator Lee.